All right, here we are. It's CDK Day 2021. Did I get the date? Yeah, I got the date right. That scared me for a minute. I'm Eric Johnson. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm a senior developer advocate uh, for serverless at AWS, and I'll be one of your hosts today. Matt, tell them who you are. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Bonig. I am your other host for track two today. I am an AWS DevTools hero. All right. And I'm going to point out Kim down here. Kim and some others will be interpreting. They asked me to do it. I, I can't. I couldn't. So Kim's going to take over it. Uh, I told her she could laugh at me. That's okay. So uh, and now I want to bring on the man, the myth, the legend, the person who kind of is behind all this uh, is Mr. Matt Coulter. Do I say? Do I even say your last name right? Matt Coulter, NID developer. Talk to talk to us. Awesome. So yes. Um... If anybody doesn't know me, my name is Matt Coulter. And essentially, I came up with the crazy idea of CDK Day about eight months ago. And everything has snowballed from there to today. But I wanted to take just a minute or two at the start here to just set the scene and make sure that everyone's on the same page for what we're going to do today. So if you don't know, there are multiple CDKs out there. It's not just AWS CDK. We have CDK for Terraform. CDKs for Kubernetes. There is Progen, which is the CDK for project configuration. And then also there's others, like last year we had CDK for Azure. So this whole event is organized on community and spirit and zero budget. So in order to make sure that everybody who's been involved in bringing this from idea to reality, I wanted to show the entire organizing committee to you all now and thank them for being involved in this, for all their hard work and their continuing work throughout the next four hours or so. You know, so you can see them all on screen here. We have Zenzi, Sadia, you've already met Matt, uh, Valiswa, there's me, Mirabella, Tatenda, Thorsten, Eric, Sebastian, Ignacio, and Marcia. So each and every one of them has put in their own personal time to try and make this a reality. So thank you. The next important thing is the whole day is being covered under a code of conduct, and that code of conduct is in effect across every channel. So that's YouTube, Slack, The Wonder Me, anywhere that we're talking about CDK Day, the code of conduct is enforced. And you can view it at cdkday.com slash coc. If anybody breaches it, email report at cdk.dev, and that will come through to me where we will take steps. Finally, how are you going to interact throughout the day? This We don't want this event to just be a long video stream that people feel disengaged from. So there's a few different ways that you can interact. The first one is interact with at CDK Day on Twitter for just general fun comments. We will retweet you. We will like you. We will try and connect people that way. The second is on the cdk.dev Slack space. We have two channels. So there's CDK Day dash track one and CDK Day dash track two. And that's for live text chat on each of the tracks throughout the day. While the, you know, if you want to actually chat while the talk is ongoing. And then finally, we are trying out wonder.me as a platform for the hallway. So this is a platform where you can walk up to people and it turns on video and voice and you can have a chat. So this isn't something that you want to do whilst the, you know, a talk is ongoing. This is more if you see a talk and you want to talk about something after it with a few friends, jump over to there and you can, you can do it like you would have in a regular conference. So there is a password on that and the password is pancakes. All of this information is available at cdkday.com slash watch. Matt, I'm going to clarify real quick. Uh, that's pancakes, right? Because I heard pound cakes, uh, and that can just be the accent, but pancakes, P-A-N-C-A-K-E-S. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. The food. The food that I'm you not like hassling so you. I'm just clarifying. Yes. No, and with that, that's everything I had to share. So I will pass you back to Eric, who will continue, I guess, the rest of today. Thank All you. right. Uh, and Matt, real quick, uh, these are the two. So there's two tracks like you talked about, and here's direct links to them. So you can quickly drop, jump back and forth if you need to. Track one uh, is at s12d.com forward slash CDK day one. And there's CDK day two. Also, these QR codes uh, are ready. Matt Bonick, did you want to say anything else? 
I uh, just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming today, whether this be morning, afternoon, or evening. We really appreciate all the support from the community having uh, put this together now for a second time. We couldn't do this without you, and we wouldn't do this if it wasn't for you. So thank you very much. Uh, I apologize about my uh, little technical issues this morning. Uh, it was either you see a green screen or you don't see my face. And although EJ really preferred... I say I have my preference. EJ had a preference, but I defeat... <laughs> I, I decided that it was more important to see my face. So uh, I will be seeing everybody over on track two starting here in about 35 minutes. And until then, I can't wait to see what Eric is about to show you. We're super excited. Thank you, everybody. All right. Well, I'm going to get started here. So it's just going to be me and Kim for a while. Uh, and Kim's gonna, Kim, I'm going to try to not talk super fast, but you know, there it is. So today I want to tell you a story. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how better together AWS SAM and AWS CDK. Now, before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, again, I'm a principal developer advocate for serverless at AWS. I've been a solutions architect uh, forever. Uh, I'm a father of five. That is not a typo. That is the real thing. Now, real quick. Before I continue, I, I need to give you some of the rules here. Uh, when I'm talking, now this isn't a live session, but and rules may not be, may be a little strong, but but maybe guidelines to understand what I'm saying. Because I like to use my hands a lot, and and it's kind of confusing. So here's the rules. Number one, this is any number I want it to be. I promise you, I'm going to hold this up and say five kids, a table for seven. 99 bottles of Diet Dr. Pepper on the wall, whatever. So you got to listen to what I'm saying and not what I'm what I'm holding up. And that's 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 just it. That's just it. These are thumbs. I I, I do this all the time. Hey, how you doing? Hey, you know. And these are quotes, not apostrophes. And I know that. So I, I use that all the time. The other day I was working. So there's the rules. There's the guidelines that'll help you understand. So back to about me. I'm a father of five. Um, I'm a Diet Dr. Pepper and pizza fanatic. If you follow me on Twitter, which I encourage you to do at EDJ Geek, uh, you'll hear a lot about that. I'm a drummer. I used to say musician, but a lot of people say, nope, just a drummer. Uh, and then I, and I also started the hashtag serverless for everyone because I do believe in serverless for everyone and helping uh, folks understand serverless. And I am an AWS SAM fanatic. And I know you might be saying to yourself right now, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is a CDK day presentation. Yes, but I'm going to talk about Sam. In fact, I'm going to tell you a love story. Today, we're going to do a love story about two frameworks. Let's get started. In the early days, right, there were developers and they wanted to build serverless applications. Now, I say early days and, you know, when serverless really came around, it was 2014. And, and uh, so, that's, you know, that's early to my kids, but for me, that's just yesterday, right? But they wanted to build serverless applications. They wanted to be able to build these, but use a framework. They didn't want to have to hand roll all their scripts. They didn't want to, have to manage all the dependencies by themselves. They didn't want to have to do everything. So they wanted to build service applications, but they wanted to do it easier. So around came this little creature, SAM, the AWS serverless application model. And the people were happy. But then we also came came around a little bit later and we had this little creature whose pancakes the, the, the otter and we have seen the squirrel. And this is the AWS Cloud Development Kit. And you've probably heard of this one. You've probably heard of both. If you're at this uh, particular uh, event, you've probably heard of the Cloud Development Kit. And we're going to dive into that a little more, but we're going to do it and talk about Sam. Now, both solutions, they came in and said, you know, we both provide infrastructure as code, right? We're based on AWS CloudFormation. We use that for deployment, uh, and they have different, you know, different ways of handling it. They both provide a CLI for creating and deploying applications. They work with non-serverless resources. Did you know that? I'm sure you did with CDK. With CDK, you can build all kinds of stuff on AWS Cloud using CDK. But also with SAM, SAM because it's built on top of CloudFormation, you can build all kinds of stuff. So both did that, and they're both open sourced. But it was still a single life for our two characters. AWS SAM and AWS CDK 
did some things similarly, similarly, did some things differently. AWS SAM uses JSON or YAML templates to declare resources. AWS or um, AWS CDK uses familiar programming languages like Python or Note, different things like that. AWS SAM uses pseudo-parameters and logical functions for dynamic references. You get the region, get things like that. AWS CDK has a lot of these references as well, and then also uses native language capabilities for dynamic references, where I can loop through building Lambda functions and things like that. And AWS SAM enables local invocation of Lambda functions via the, the AWS SAM CLI. However, the AWS CDK at this time does not do this. So being smart like CDK folks were, they said, you know what? We should get to know AWS SAM. And so we had our first date with the CDK synthesize. And what the CDK synthesize allows you to do is you can synthesize out a CloudFormation template right out of CDK that allows you to use the AWS SAM CLI for local debugging and testing. And it's, it's a great product. However, Developers tell us that, that there's still some, that's an extra step they weren't wanting to take, right? So they, they, they had to go in, they synthesize it, and then, and then they need to go in and find the logical names and things like that. So we had our first challenge, right? And the developers told us that they want local development tools regardless of which of these frameworks they choose, and they want to be able to do it as easily as possible. And both the CDK team and the same team want to provide that. So we had our first makeup and we listened. We listened to the developers. We heard them saying, look, we want it to be easier. We want it to be mo more seamless. And so today, and actually last night, if you've been reading the blogs or you saw the tweets go out, we have this huge announcement, the AWS SAM CLI support for local testing of AWS CDK projects. And this is uh, dare I say the word natively, you're able to use these without synthesizing out a, a template. A AWS SAM is going to work within a CDK project directly or natively, and it's going to work seamlessly, meaning I'm not going to have to change anything in the CDK project. It's just going to work, uh, you know, with the structure uh, and, and the setup. So let me talk a little bit more about what this means. It means that whether, regardless, I'm <laughs> how you doing? Regardless if I'm using SAM or CDK, I have access to SAM build, SAM local invoke, SAM local start API, SAM local start Lambda, SAM local generate event. There's a little asterisk there because you already have access to this, but you may not have installed SAM to work with your CDK projects. So you can do SAM local generate event and SAM logs. And these are all tools for local development and debugging. So now we have a celebration. And by that, we're going to see it in action. I'm going to spend some time demoing this project so you can see what it does. So first of all, before we jump in, I want to tell you about the application that we built. All right. So the application is a translation application, which tends to be what I built a lot because I like using these. And the way it's going to work is, number one, a user sends in a string of text and an array of, of languages. And they're going to send that, and, and it's going to get uh, sent from API Gateway to a Lambda function. The Lambda function then makes a request to Amazon Translate to translate each th that string of text into each of those languages. It then comes back, and at this point, it's going to do two things. First, it's going to push those translations onto an event bus, an event bridge event bus, and then it's going to return the translations to the user. So it's a synchronous call for the user, and they get it back immediately. However, we're going to do some asynchronous work on this as well. By putting those events on the bus, it's then going to invoke another Lambda function, which puts that those uh, translations into DynamoDB as separate records. Then later, it's available through request where a user could come in, they can hit the API endpoint, and they can get those translations. So we have this application. Now, now why did I do it on an event bus? I wanted to do this asynchronously because I may do more than just translate uh, the Lambda functions. I may take those translations and actually turn them into audio recordings, or I may do sentiment recordings. So by using EventBridge, I have a bus that I can trigger where I can invoke more than one Lambda function based on the rules. All right, so let's get started. I'm going to drop this out of here, do some very secret uh, 
moving around of uh, my stuff. Okay. Bear with me one moment. I seem to have a uh, PowerPoint that's not releasing. There we go. All right. So let's jump into some code. Oh, I'm telling you, my machine seems to be giving me a hard time. Matt, you're not the only one. Your green screen's bad. My machine seems to be fighting me on this. All right, so I'm using Visual Studio Code here. I have a CDK project already. Now, I'm going to be full disclosure, straight up front. I am not a CDK expert. Uh, I look like it. I get that, but I am not a CDK expert. However, I was able to quickly build an application. I love it. Like I said, I am a SAM fan. I'm also a CDK fan, and I like using the right tool for the job. And they're very comparable, and they, they approach things a little differently. All right, so looking at our project, uh, real quick, I'm going to show you in here. It's, it's the, And I know this is huge. I hope that's not too big. Uh, I'm going to show you the structure is a standard. I just I, I use CDK init with this. It is a TypeScript one. And we're going to go to my live folder. And I'm going to show you the CDK template. Let's drop this out so you can see it. Now, this is a pretty standard one. Now, here's one, one thing to understand is at this moment in time, the, the SAM integration that I'm going to show only works with the uh, AWS Lambda construct. It does not work at the moment with the Node construct and the Python construct, but those are forthcoming. And I'm going to be talking about dependency management here using SAM, but you can also do dependency management using the Node construct and the Python construct. So clarify on that. All right, so you can see here I'm just building some standard uh, resources, the event bridge, everything's in here that I need. So the first thing I'm going to do is I, I'm going to deploy this. And actually, I've already deployed it. Now, you may be saying, whoa, whoa, wait, hang on a sec. If this is for local development, why do I have to deploy it? You don't have to deploy the project for local development to work. However, in a regular service application, in a real-life service application, we interact with serverless services with our Lambda functions, right? So a Lambda function may call out to DynamoDB or EventBridge, much like my uh, my example application does. And so in developing, we want that local Lambda function to be able to talk to the services. Well, they have to be deployed. So I'm going to deploy at minimum, get my infrastructure out there, my DynamoDB table, my EventBridge uh, th that I need for those out there. I can deploy the Lambda functions uh, as well, because I have some asynchronous stuff going on. So what I'm going to do is, is to deploy that, I'm going to go ahead. The first thing I'm going to do is do SAM build. Now, I want to show you really quick here back to our structure. Is if you look in the, uh, the actual source file here, it's so big, I'm having a hard time getting it. So here's my function. In my function, I do not have any dependencies in here. Uh, with with Sam, the way that Sam is going to work with this is I don't have to manage those dependencies uh, from from uh, from CDK or or manually. I can do them within Sam. So let's take a look at that real quick here. All right. So you can see again, I have no dependencies. Although I'm saying what dependencies I need. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Sam to build it. Now, if you read the the blog the other night. If you install this beta version, and this is a beta version, we'll talk more about that. If you install it, it's going to install side by side with the normal SAM client. So I have SAM on here, you can see. And then I also have SAM beta CDK. And you're going you're to laugh because I fat finger all the time. Just the one finger, but I'm going to fat finger. All right, so both versions are on there. So I'm going to get rid of this. So back to our, our instructions here. I'm going to bring my terminal up so you can see that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to build the application. And what Sam's going to do is it's going to take, it's going to install all the dependencies. If it's a language that needs compiling, it's going to handle compiling uh, like a .NET or, or a Java or something like that. And then it's going to uh, export uh, it, and it also uses uh, the actual CDK synth to grab the template. And then it's going to export all the assets in the cloud assembly so that CDK has everything it needs to do the deployment. So let's go ahead and do that build. So I'm going to do AWS, I'm sorry, SAM beta CDK build. Uh, and I'm going to do them in parallel if I can spell. I'm sure I spelled that wrong. So let's do that again. A-L. This is painful to watch me do this. I'm sure 
for folks. There we go. Parallel tells Sam that instead of doing one at a time, build them all at the same time. And that works if your machine has a little beef to it. If it doesn't, then, then you can also have it. It'll just do them one at a time. So, all right. Now, once that's built and it's almost done, then you see here it says do a CDK deploy. So I can do a CDK, CDK deploy, but I'm going to point it to the, to the cloud assembly that I want to use, and that's under the SAM build folder. So let's take a look at what SAM did. Sam actually went out here and under the Sam build folder, there you go. We have our CDK out, which is what, what CDK would output. And then we have our build folder. And then Sam will actually group these by stack, right? Because CDK obviously manages multiple stacks. So you can, you can, uh, it will actually output the different stack needs. Under those are each of the assets that are needed. Okay, and so I've got, you'll notice, now I have my dependencies in place. So I can use, and, and I also have the logical name of my function. So, so Sam has built those out and put those in place for the CDK to use. All right, so let's look at actually getting into de uh, developing and local development with that. Now that we kind of have everything in place, uh, let's do that. The one last thing I want to show you before we do this is with Sam, and if we're using these uh, services that are actually in the cloud, I'm going to use a local environments file folder. And I want to show you what that looks like really quick. <clears throat> Let me move this over. Whew. Okay, so hold my terminal down. I'm getting killed by all the sizes here. Here we go. What this does is this tells the functions, and I address the function by stack name and function name, and this is the function identifier, the CDK, that you put into CDK when you build the function. And then I tell the variable is that file or that, that table. So I have a table, I have a bus, and, and then another table. So this is going to tell any local function, Lambda function, hey, when you talk to the services of the cloud, this is the table name you want to use, this is the event bridge bus you want to use. All right. <clears throat> enough of that. Let's get started. So we built that and I've already deployed it, uh, but I could have done a deploy to kind of show that. So, uh, you, and, and we'll probably do that at the end here. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to, in this, I want to push a mock or I want to push a mock event onto DynamoDB. I want to actually do a request. And I'm going to do it. There's several ways I can use SAM to test things. I can directly invoke the Lambda function, or I can do it through an API gateway emulator. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do it by directly invoking the Lambda function. <clears throat> Excuse me. So to do that, I have a mock event that, that shows what, it, what an event would look like with uh, through API Gateway, because while we're invoking it directly, my code's expecting it to be in an API Gateway event. So I have these mock events. And if you're wondering where, how, how in the world would I know what those look like? Well, earlier I said we have access to SAM local generate event. That function will actually generate these events out for you. So here's my date. Here's the request I'm making. Here's the body that's being sent. Uh, and this is the event I'm going to use. So the command to do this. And on a full disclosure, I'm not going to type all these commands. I'm going to be doing some cutting and pasting because we'd be here four times as long if I were typing them directly. That's just the truth of it. So, all righty, uh, because I'm not a fast typer and I misspell. So this command says I'm going to do SAM beta CDK local invoke. And, I, and the function I want you to invoke is found in the CDK day stack, and it's called put translation function. I'm going to do a minus E or a dash dash event. And I'm going to say events put translation.json, which is the event I just showed you. And then I'm going to pass that locals variable file. Now, there's a lot to type there. If you, I have a blog and I'll shoot out a link to it a little bit later uh, that shows you how to put these, this information in a SAM config file so that really all you would have to do is say just, just the local invoke and the function name. Uh, so there's a lot of optimization you can do with SAM and SAM build and, and, and all the SAM commands to do that. All right, so let's see what happens. So this is going to just shoot, create an event uh, or create a translation request. So what happens is, is it's going to actually load up, happen kind of quicker, so I'll go down. It mounts the actual CDK day asset 
and or WebAssembly, and then it invokes that and passes that event in just like API Gateway would have done. And I'm going to do it again, but this time I'm going to pass it to JQ so you can see the response a little cleaner. <clears throat> All right, and so now you can see I've made my request, which was, this is my text, very clever. I came up with that. The original language was English and it translated it to French and uh, German. Okay, so so then I got those requests back. I didn't, I did, now I did talk to DynamoDB in the cloud. It's actually, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, the translate function in the cloud. Uh, and it got those translations back, but the entire invocation was done locally within the SAM CLI. Now, because I did use the cloud and I did write this to DynamoDB, uh, and, and what's gonna happen is, uh, and, and my code actually puts it on the event bus, is the, if the Lambda function in the cloud that's asynchronously triggered by EventBridge will have happened. So we can check that. And this, this one's job is to write this data to DynamoDB. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna locally invoke the function uh, that does the get against this, okay? So it, it, it's gonna do a get request. Again, it's gonna locally invoke the local function that reads the DynamoDB table. So let's see if that's out there. So this one, again, same, same format, same beta CDK, local invoke. And this time I'm doing the get translation function and I'm gonna pass the get translation event with the locals. So if I do that, you can see my data is here. Now you may say, Eric, you ran that twice. Yeah, I ran it twice with the same ID so that it got overridden. So only one piece of data came back, all right? So I can do this. I can also do the get all. So I have a, a function that says get all translations, and it goes to the same Lambda function locally, and this will actually list all the original requests, which are just the English version, okay? All right, so, so the last one I can do is I'm going to actually grab, uh, I'm going to actually check the, so, so I told you asynchronously, when I submitted this data, it wrote that data to the event bridge. That event bridge has a rule that triggers or invokes uh, a save Lambda function. I wanna see what it looked like in the cloud uh, because this because this isn't local, it's actually going through and working up in, in Amazon. So I can actually connect to that function using SAM logs. So with SAM logs, I'm gonna do, and this is actually available now, I don't have to do SAM beta CDK, but I'm gonna do SAM beta CDK logs, and then the name of the actual function, right? And, and this is when I do a deploy, this is output for me. And, and this says, I want the logs from there. So rather than having to go out, go out to CloudWatch immediately, I can see here, yep, it trace happened, it started, it ended. Here's the data that was written because uh, I'm actually uh, outputting that in a log and there it is. So I can, I can sit here and do that. And if I do a minus T on that, it's actually gonna tail that log. So if I went back and made more invocations, I'm gonna get more data coming on here. A great way to debug locally of things going on in the cloud that are asynchronous that you wanna follow. All right, so that is local invoking of the Lambda function directly, all right? So the next thing we wanna do, and, and, and for a use case for that, generally what we're gonna do is that's for quick iterations against code. I, I'm writing that Lambda function, I wanna change it, and so I, I, you know, I'm gonna iterate against that. All right, so the next thing here uh, is we're gonna look at local start API. So what this does is the local start API actually starts a API gateway emulator that wraps that Lambda function. Now it doesn't do everything API Gateway does, but it does enough for you to, to, for you to iterate against your code and test that it's working. It works with API, REST APIs and HTTP APIs. So let's go ahead and start that. Now while that's starting, I'm gonna explain this command. Uh, the command was SAM beta. Here it is, oh, it got, out of, it got out of view just a minute here. The command was SAM beta CDK local start API. And then I pass this flag called warm containers and I give it a, a value of eager. So what that tells SAM to do is load each of these endpoints up in a container and keep it hot or keep it warm, depends on how you like to say it, so that the invocations happen fast, right? So they can happen uh, quick against it, right? So the, what I'm gonna do uh, is I can actually do another window here 
and I'm going to test that. So I've got this local emulator. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put another piece of another translation in here as if through an API gateway. Okay, so I'm going to curl. I'm going to pass the data. I'm going to pass the translations. I'm changing the message a little bit. So let's go ahead and hit enter. And you saw over on the left side, you immediately saw my API gateway react, my emulator react. And then on the right side, I've got data back that says, hey, that translation went through. All right. So the next thing I can do is I'm going to list all the translations that are happening. Again, I'm just using curl, but your client can be your local. You could be running a, a spa locally to test against this, just pointing at this API gateway. I use I use Postman all the time as my local client to test this. Uh, but because this is CDK day and, and a lot of smart folks watching, I wanted to do curl and look cool. That's just the truth. All right. So next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually list all the requests that have been or the, all the translations that have been done so far. Okay, so I've got that. Uh, you can see the response here. I'm gonna actually pipe that to JQ so you can see that a little clearer. And you notice API Gate was responding very quickly, right? Okay, so now I've got this translation and it's got an ID, okay? And again, this returns only to English or the original requests at the moment. So I wanna actually get the full translation of this statement. So I'm going to do this again and I'm gonna add my ID. Uh, in quote, and let's see what that looks like. And there you go. So now I've got all the translations that were put in for that phrase. Again, I haven't deployed anything else. This is just simply working locally. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is I want to change. Uh, you notice in here, I'm going to push this real quick. I'm going to do this again, and I'm going to list it or pipe it to JQ so we can see it a little easier. Notice in here, I don't have the, the language set for the for the translation that was put in. This should say that it's English, but it's just the ID in the train. I'm sorry, that's not the one I wanted to do. Let me try that again. Get rid of the ID. I know all of you are thinking right now, he could have upgraded twice. That's not how I work. All right, there we go. So now you see in here that I've got the different translations, but it doesn't show the language they were put in. And I really wanted to show that. So I'm going to go back to my code. So this is, I said, iterating against our code, right? And I'm going to go to that function, which is the get translation function. And I'm going to un or comment out. So I'm deleting that, okay? So I'm actually going to comment out that line. Okay, I'm going to save that. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, you're going to have to restart the API because it's an emulator. I really don't. All I need to do is I need to build again. Uh, I can't talk and type, so bear with me one more. <laughs> You're like, why are you a presenter? Well, there is that. Okay, so I'm going to build that again. I want you to watch the left side when I do this build. Uh, how are you doing? Spelling's bad. All right. Uh, I, I talked to Stefano, who's in charge of the, the team that's building this, and they're actually going to put B-E-U-I-L-D, too, because I always type it that way. It's probably not the best workaround. Okay. I the right word. Okay, there we go. Sam Beta CDK, build, boom. There we go. So now it's synthesizing the app again. It's creating that template. It's going to build out these changes and, and copy those back into the web, to the cloud assembly that I can use with, uh, with my, my CDK application here. And notice over here, Sam picked up and said, oh, hey, the code has changed. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, next time you invoke that, I'm switching to lazy mode for this next invoke. Next time you invoke it, I'm going to re-up that code, right? So let's go ahead and run the, the list again, okay? It re-upped that code, so it took just a little longer that time, but now my language is in there. So hopefully you're getting the idea of how fast you can iterate against these different things, right? So you're able to come in and say, look, I'm going to iterate against my Lambda, go, go, go. I'm, I'm talking to remote services uh, and, and and it's going to work fine. The, the other uh, command that you're able to do is the, the local start Lambda. We're not going to go into that one today just for time reasons, but this one allows you to do uh, testing with local, like if I were testing from a, an SDK or the AWS SAM CLI. And, and there's a blog, and I'll mention the blog here or a link to the blog here in a moment, but uh, that, that kind of walks you. If you want to try this on your own, you can walk through all this as well. 
uh, and it will uh, it'll show you that. So, all right. So let me get my PowerPoint for some reason died on me. So I've got to kind of figure out what's going on here. Um, so if we can bring it back up. Oh, man. Please bear with me. I apologize. All right. Well, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about what I, what I was going to show on there. I'm, I'm not missing a whole lot at the moment. But um, with – let me just close PowerPoint. There we go. All right. Technical difficulties are always the joy of our job. And, uh, yeah. All right. Okay. So coming out of that, now I'll be answering questions. Um, oh, someone said not a demo if everything gets planned. Well, that's true, but uh, not true. I, I disagree a little bit. It's it's still a demo. It's showing how everything works. It just keeps me from having to uh, type everything. So, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, absolutely okay on, on how you want to approach that. So, all right, let me open this back up. Hmm. And it's uh, not not open. I'm telling you, PowerPoint has just completely died. So I'll tell you what we're doing. So what I'm going to do, uh, if you look up, uh, I want to talk to you about how we're approaching the build on this. So what our, what we're trying to do is this is an open source. And that means that we, we want both the CDK uh, community and the SAM community to help us build this, you know, in, 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 in the way they want to see it, right. That in, in what they want to see, no, no features too small, no, you know, no bug or no bug is too small, no features too big to, to do this. And look at here, I finally got it working while I'm talking. Um, all right. So that's the end of the demo here. And so let's go on. So again, like I said, the plan is we, with the AWS SAM CLI and, and the CDK as well, and, I, and I'm not speaking for the CDK team, but I know, they want to meet developers where they are, regardless of the framework that we're building. We want we want to focus on fast, intuitive tools for serverless development. And these two services work. It, it really is a marriage that they work together and they work well uh, in doing that. They're both open source tools. Again, no bug is too small, no features too big. We want input from both communities. Really encourage you to do that. If you want to help with the open source, you can go to s12d.com, SAMCLI, or this QR code. All of our PR requests are done there. All the issues are handled there. Uh, be part of the family. Uh, be part of the family of this, you know, this union here, this love story. <clears throat> This is the blog. If you want to run this demo yourself and kind of walk through it and see how these work, uh, s12d.com forward slash better together. I encourage you to, to check that out and, and see how that works. For more information like this, we maintain a thing called serverlesslane.com. It's a website that has lots of stuff. Again, I'm Eric Johnson. I'm a principal developer advocate for serverless at AWS. You can find me at EDJ Geek. Uh, and I'm going to, I know we're right at time and we're going to be moving on to the next one here shortly, but I'm going to be taking questions. Uh, you can hit me on Twitter. You can hit me, uh, you know, anywhere you want, but I, Twitter's probably the best at EDJ, edjgeek.com. I hope you enjoy the rest of CDK day. The team has worked very hard. Uh, this is an, um, an amazing, uh, setup and we're excited to have you. And with that, Let's move into our next one. Now we have a weird transition here because not only am I uh, doing the first session, but I'm also hosting. <clears throat> so now I'm back into host mode and I'm looking here real quick to see if we have any questions. Uh, thank you for doffing your cap to me. I appreciate that. Uh, and my, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my enthusiasm is uh, bought and traded on Diet Dr. Pepper. That's not a lie. Um, all right. So next up, we are going to have, bear with me one second here. All right. So the next one we have is Ben Britt. Ben, are you in here? I see him. I'm going to bring him in. Ben, what's up? Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Oh, I like your shirt. <laughs> Thanks. I like yours too, although it's a little bit hidden. Yeah, yeah. I need to get, yeah, here, so it's the same plus, yeah, there you go. Very cool. So Ben, what are you going to be talking about today? Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, all the things I did wrong uh, when I wrote uh, Instagram's code, uh, you know, especially helps, focused on, on, sorry? If it helps you, I have a list of things you've done wrong. So <laughs> that's up to you. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to drop out. Nicole, you doing all right? 
Uh, see, all right, we got the salute and the thumbs up. So, okay, here we go. I'm going to drop out and I'm going to bring your screen in and good luck, sir. Perfect. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Eric. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ben. Uh, I work for a company called Cloudar uh, and I also have uh, some stories to tell. Um, I'm mostly here uh, because I made a lot of mistakes. Um, and I don't mean that giving this talk is a mistake. Uh, but uh, I've been writing infrastructure code um, for six years and a bit now um, with a lot of different tools, uh, CloudFormation and things that generate CloudFormation like uh, Troposphere and the tool set around that, uh, even before CDK was a thing. Uh, and in those six years, I had the chance to make a lot of mistakes. And if there's one thing that's better than learning from your own mistakes, it's being able to learn from somebody else's mistakes. Um, so I'm going to try to tell some of those things that went wrong when I tried things. Uh, I have to mention a few things before I get started. Uh, all of these are actual real examples, real examples of mistakes that actually happened, uh, but I recreated them all with CDK code. Uh, so that means that one, uh, I had to simplify it a bit so it would fit in on the slide and you wouldn't have to like get a magnifying glass just to read the code. Uh, so if your first direction to something that I put on the screen is why would you do it that way? It's probably because some context is missing. Um, but feel free to, to ask a question uh, after the talk. We will have 10 minutes for questions and, and we can go into that. Uh, secondly, every mistake that I will show and I will talk about is one that I made. Uh, I'm not trying to throw any shade at anyone, so if this seems like something that's familiar to you, uh, something that you might have done, um, I'm sorry, it happens to the best of us apparently, uh, but I'm not trying to single anyone out. Uh, and thirdly, uh, I'm going to be saying we and I a lot. Uh, if I say we and it's about something good, it's definitely something that we did as a team. Uh, if I say we and it's uh, something bad, I should have said I and I'm sorry for that. Uh, so that being said, uh, let me tell you some about some of the things that I actually wouldn't do again. Um, and the first, first example that I'm uh, going to be uh, looking at is a migration uh, that happened. So we had a lot of servers that had to move to AWS. It was going to be mostly a lift and shift migration. So we needed to be uh, setting up a lot of EC2 servers. Um, and there was a strict deadline uh, so we just decided we're going to make it as easy as possible for every team that needs their own servers um, so they can uh, start as soon as possible, move as much as possible uh, to the cloud before we hit that deadline. And we might want to make that possible even if they don't have a lot of AWS experience. Uh, so we decided um, we need something like this, um, where every team should be able to define their own stack put a list of instances in there, and then we would have some code, uh, in the CDK case, a construct that would take care of all the details. And the details would be putting, uh, starting the instance, putting um, everything on there, uh, having alarms and monitoring around that, making sure that integrates with all the other tools that were all already being used. Um, and the, really the only thing that the team would have to put in is names. Uh, because we're using, uh, in this case, configuration management software. So the moment that an instance would start, there would be some software on there that would fetch the name, see, oh, this one is an app server, and then install the right thing on there. If it's a web server, install Nginx. If it's an app server, uh, install Tomcat, for example, things like that. Um, so we created our construct called instance group. Uh, the my server's name here is arbitrary. The team can pick whatever they want. And then they would uh, give a list of servers they want to start. In this case, we have two app servers, two web servers. And this is a code that we wrote to actually do the heavy lifting. Um, so we know which VPC we want to use. Uh, in this example, we're using the default one, but that would be uh, one that was created externally. We have a default AMI that also has all the bootstrapping software on there. And uh, we pass that to the instance. Uh, and you can see here that we get that list of names uh, passed into the construct. And then we just loop over them uh, and create one EC2 instance for every name. Uh, the final thing that we actually have to put in there is which availability zone they go into. 
And for that, we do a little trick because we don't want them all to go into the same subnet or the same availability zone. And that's what actually would happen if you have them all in the same stack because the um, CDK will pick always the same availability zone. Uh, so we want to have, have them spread out over, over availability zones for two reasons. If they grading app one and app two, we want to have them uh, spread out. So we have a high availability there because it might be putting that in load balancer uh, later on in the stack. And also because if we wouldn't do that, then all the instances would it end up in the same subnet. We would run, run out of IPs in that subnet while the other two, one or two uh, subnets would be still empty. Um, so that's the reason that we wrote this code like this. And this is what we're uh, using as our construct. And if we uh, synth and deploy our stack, uh, this is the uh, YAML output that would get passed to CloudFormation, or at least part of it. I hit most of the other properties to make it, make it fit here. And you can see that we create uh, two sets of two servers. We have the two app servers at the top, the two web servers at the bottom, and we go uh, A, B, C, A, spread out over our three availability zones. And that all worked great, so far so good. Uh, we've successfully finished the migration. We hit that um, that deadline. Everything is running in the cloud and we can start working up on improving our apps, ma uh, making more apps. Maybe we'll actually start using uh, more serverless things. Uh, but at some point, a few months later, we actually realized, oh, actually we can improve this app as well. Um, we maybe added some database servers and at some point we want to connect to, to those servers directly and we need a Bastion instance. Um, so we do exactly that. We open up our uh, old CDK code. We um, open, um, add our Bastion to the instance group. And because we know our ABCs and we like to have things neat, we put Bastion in between app two and web one. Um, and our constructs works exactly as we expect. So we go from this old output to, to, to this new output. And here we see our um, Bastion instance appears uh, in the middle of that. Uh, there's one problem. Uh, that's not the only thing that has changed. So because we added that in the middle uh, and we're looping over our instances, uh, we also changed the availability zones. And that's a problem because if we're changing availability zones means a recreation of the instance. And um, it's a hard problem because it's not easy to spot. Uh, from the consumer side of things, from the, the teams using our construct, they didn't really change anything related to those instances. So they don't really expect something to change. They think it's a very low risk change because they only added uh, one server that's independent of everything else. And from our constructs point of view, there's also nothing strange going on because as if we, uh, we're testing that, um, that code, and as long as the inputs stay the same, our outputs don't change, and it does the looping over the um, availability zones correctly, and we're saving the uh, list of availability zones in our uh, context file. So all of those things don't change, but still we get that, um, that shift in availability zones. And the only actual realistic place to spot this is uh, in the CloudFormation change sets. And that's hoping that we're actually checking that, which was the case in this story. Uh, and that the person checking that actually understands that an instance replacement is something that they don't want. Uh, if you don't spot it there, then it's uh, hopefully your um, staging environment that sees those replacements and not your production environment. We did get to learn from this. Uh, so that's a, the real reason from this talk, of course. I'm not just uh, talking about my mistakes. I also want to uh, explain uh, which lessons I'm taking from them. Um, this one is not really actionable, uh, but it's sometimes a good indication if you think you're being clever, uh, there might be something you're missing. Uh, the real lesson from this story, um, on the other hand, is to have a way to build mechanical sympathy. It, it's very important to uh, build that into your abstractions uh, and have teams be able uh, to learn um, how they behave uh, behind the scenes. Uh, so what is mechanical sympathy? Uh, it's the idea that you uh, can never be successful if everything is 100% invisible to you. 
Uh, the typical example of that is that you don't need to be a mechanic to be a Formula One, Formula One pilot, but you need to have a general idea of the things that are happening under the hood. So that you uh, know how the car will react in certain situations, um, that you know what to listen to if, if the engine starts making strange noise, and that you uh, actually have some early feedback if you're uh, pushing uh, your car to do things it wasn't meant to do. Uh, if you don't have that mechanical sympathy, uh, you will miss that. And uh, if we don't, if you write a construct that doesn't expose things that the user of that construct uh, should or might care about, we're actually uh, setting them up for failure because they will miss all those early warnings and they will not um, have an uh, intuitive, intuitive understanding of what we're actually uh, creating. Uh, so a better way that we have, could have done this, for example, was to, um, instead of creating a construct, uh, creating some examples showing what are all the things we need if we uh, set up an EC2 instance and then have the teams put in the level 2 constructs directly in their code or maybe build a level 3 construct around a single instance uh, so that they can um, use that, uh, that we don't have that loop and that we can much, easy, much more easily expose all those things that they actually should care about that might trigger a replacement. So things like the AMI, the, the availability zone, the subnets, uh, maybe security groups. Uh, we want to uh, surface that um, so that uh, it's not a black box for the teams using it. Another story that I wanted to talk, uh, to talk about, uh, and this has multiple mistakes, uh, spoiler alert, alert um, is to do with custom resources. So sometimes you might find that the resource that you want to create in your AWS account is not supported by a level one resource. Um, and because it's not supported by a level one resource, there will also be no level two or level three resource. And there can be multiple reasons for that. Uh, it might not be supported in CloudFormation itself. You um, might want to uh, create a resource that actually doesn't live in, inside of AWS, uh, like I know that Banky, who once made his uh, Hue lights turn on and off with CloudFormation. So if you want to do something like that, that might also be a reason that there's no resource for that. And in both those ca cases, uh, you can still manage those inside your CloudFormation stack if you write a bit of glue code yourself. And I'm going to do that with an example here. And in that example, I'm going to assume that there isn't a custom resource, that, that there isn't a, a resource yet for the SSM parameter store parameters. Uh, I know they are, uh, but it's a very good example just to, to, uh, just to go through all the actions you would take to create such a custom resource. So this is uh, the full code of what that would look like or could look like. Uh, and if you look at the uh, top right here, uh, you see that if we use that in our stack, it's almost the same uh, as using that level one or level two resource directly. We're um, giving it a, a, a name or an ID, uh, and then we say the, the name of the parameter should be test, and the value of the parameter should be something. And then if you look below that, you see uh, the actual implementation of that, and there's a very useful uh, CDK class that helps us create custom resources, where we uh, say, uh, on create, when this gets created in the stack, you should uh, execute this API call. Uh, when it gets updated, you, sh you should update, uh, execute this API call. When it gets deleted, uh, this other API call, um, and so forth. And you can see the API calls on the left above that. Uh, it's basically doing SSM put parameter or SSM delete parameter. And, and that's all we have to write, and CDK will take care of gluing it all together and doing the right. Uh, API calls. Um, this is the actual um, rendered out template of that. So you can see that we have our custom resource in here that is of type custom uh, colon colon AWS, where we have those create, update, and delete actions. Uh, what you can't see here is that the rest of the line would have the, uh, the name and the value in there as well. And then uh, we also see that that service token defines what is the underlying Lambda function that gets executed for that. And that's the one starting with AWS 6.7. So that would actually execute those commands. 
And then uh, underneath that, we see that we also get some uh, custom resources that are created by the CDK that are used to set that log retention that we specified earlier, because uh, there are some tricky things with CloudWatch logs. And if your log group already um, exists, you can put the log rotation on there that easily. So uh, CDK decides that they're going to be using their own custom resource for that. And it's that log thing that's also part of the problem, uh, that and Lambda functions. So uh, if we do it like this, we get those two Lambda functions, those two custom resources for every stack that uses um, our SSM parameter. So once you start uh, having a little bit of more than one stack uh, and, and working with multiple teams, that can grow very rapidly. You see uh, here a screenshot. This is just from my testing that resource seven times. Just create, delete seven times. And this isn't even the, the full uh, screen of it. That's all the things that stick around after the delete. So the lock groups, they stay, uh, they keep, uh, they stay. Um, which is not a great thing because it becomes very hard to start looking for uh, errors. If something goes wrong, you don't really know which log group you need to look. You need to go to the stack and then from the stack to the Lambda console and from the Lambda console, open the monitoring tab and then go back to CloudWatch. Uh, so it's it's not an easy, it's easy way to keep managing that um, because it's never obvious where you want to look. And I already teased a little bit, there's a second mistake in here as well. Uh, so let's take a, a, a bit of a closer look at what I wrote, um, especially on this part, and uh, maybe even a, a look that's a little bit closer. Uh, you see that I mistyped something. So instead of uh, writing name, I wrote gnome, and that might seem like a very small innocent mistake, and, and it is, and it's very easy to make, but it has some very annoying effects on our deployed stacks, uh, especially if... Um, if you're not creating resources that are basically free, if this would create an EMR cluster, for example, uh, and the delete fails, then you might uh, have a very high cost that's uh, not easy to spot until you get a bill. Because this is what the CloudFormation stack will look like after the delete. So uh, we deployed the stack, we clicked in the CloudFormation console on delete stack, and you can see here that the delete was successful for the Lambda functions. Um, but the delete failed for our parameter. And that means that that parameter still exists, but we don't have the code anymore that will be able to uh, retry that delete because that Lambda function got deleted. So there's no way to automatically clean that up, even if we would try the delete again here. Uh, so that's not good. And what makes that even more annoying is that once you notice this in one stack, uh, we'll have to go and update all the stacks that use this uh, custom resource, of course. So now we have to go to all the teams, make sure that they're using the latest versions, that they update their dependencies, that they actually do one more deploy before they delete things. Because if they uh, don't do that, if they do the delete of a parameter together with the updated uh, dependencies, then um, that won't have any effect because actually going to delete it first. Uh, so it, it's a very hard problem to solve. Um, once it gets deployed in, in lots of stacks and it, it's something you actually um, can get fairly annoying. We did also learn from this, of course. Um, the main lesson here is that your custom resources are applications and you should manage them as such. So this means they should have their own stack. You should create them once per account and you should actually think of them like how you might think of a VPC that's shared between different applications. And that also means you need to do the same things uh, that you would do with them that you would uh, do with other service applications. You have to manage metrics and logs. You probably want to create that log group before um, the function gets created. So you can uh, you don't have, you don't have to use that custom resource there. Um, and in general, uh, you want to be prepared to keep supporting the application for as long as it sticks around. Uh, there are some CloudFormation features that can help here if you do that. So for example, if you're saying we're going to split this up in one central stack and then stacks that use the resources, we can use uh, exports in the central stack and import value in all the other stacks. And then we are confident that as long as there is at least one 
resource that's using that function or that's pointing to that Lambda function that we can't delete it. So we know that we also always have that function ready to handle deletions. Um, it also gives us a lot more control about updates and log groups and monitoring because we can do that completely independent of our consumers. So if, you if we find a mistake or if the underlying API would change and we need to update our Lambda function, we can do that without having to involve any other team, just the team that's responsible for that stack. Um, and also something something that's important to keep in mind. If you're, uh, if you're creating a construct that creates uh, Lambda functions for somebody else, they become responsible for that Lambda function. And it's important that they know that. And it's also important to be able to uh, to be able to, to have a way to update those functions when needed. Uh, finally, uh, in the theme of using CloudFormation features, there is actually a CloudFormation helper library that um, can help with some of the boilerplate when implementing your custom resource as a Lambda, because if you put in a central stack, we can't use that AWS custom resource CDK class anymore. But to be honest, there is a better way to do that. Uh, if you need uh, something that would be a custom resource uh, today, and you're not using custom resources yet, or you want to move away from them, uh, the private resource types that were re released in, I think, December 2019 are the better option in almost every way. You can basically think of them as custom resources version 2. Uh, they're using the same framework that AWS uses to develop the native CloudFormation types. So you also get a lot of the features that native CloudFormation types get. There's one downside, and that is that the initial learning curve is still a bit steep, especially compared to that AWS custom resource that we just did. Uh, and there's a lot more information that you can find about how you develop service applications uh, compared to how you would write uh, resource providers. Uh, but there are also a lot of open source repositories that have uh, resource providers in them. The AWS ones, um, or some of the AWS ones, are actually open source. And the extra features that you get from uh, building it that way is, in my opinion, definitely worth the, the investment. And then finally, uh, I, I still have a few minutes to talk about a third mistake that I made. And this is um, not going to be any code anymore. It's going to be more of a story. And it's actually going to be about how my typical flow is if I create an, uh, an abstraction. So that would be a, a construct in CDK or a module in, uh, in CloudFormation, um, how that uh, usually uh, goes. So usually that starts with very good intentions. Uh, there is something I can fix. Uh, there is an, a construct or a resource in CloudFormation, and it doesn't it isn't as easy to use as I think it can be. So I can make things easier and I can do that either for myself or for somebody else. Um, doesn't really matter. I see something, oh, this is, um, this could use different defaults. Like the, the settings that I put in here are not the defaults that I want to use that I want to recommend to people. For example, it's an S3 bucket and I want to make sure that it's always has that public access block enabled, uh, things like that. So that's great. I create a construct for that. I know how to do that. Uh, I wrap our, my S3 bucket inside that. I limit the amount of inputs that I accept. So uh, for example, if I don't want people to be able to set a name for that bucket, I don't, don't allow it. Uh, everything is better. I like limit what you can do. This is good, like the default way to do this. Great. Um, until you get feedback or you keep start using it more, and there will always be some place where, oh, I actually want to change the name here because I need, need to, I always, otherwise I get a circle dependency, um, or we have this one weird edge case where encryption doesn't work. So we need to disable the, uh, it, and you need to add extra properties to that. Uh, that's not a problem. You update construct, you uh, have people update their dependencies. Uh, if you're lucky that this happens never or only once, uh, if you're unlucky, you can just keep repeating that cycle uh, until you have every property in there. And even if you have all the properties in there, like the, the story isn't over yet, sometime later, there's a new feature uh, with the uh, construct that you're using or with the service that you're using, they add more properties to that construct. Uh, and now we have two imper imperfect constructs because both the one that I created uh, with the new defaults might, is not using that new one yet. 
uh, and the one that's uh, coming from CloudFormation or from CDK might not be able to use those uh, new defaults because that would break comp uh, backwards compatibility. Um, so we follow that same cycle again. And now we also have to be careful about not introducing any breaks in stacks that might already be using the older construct. So that's either being very careful, maybe we have like different versions of constructs. Uh, anyway, um, it gets complicated and this can repeat as well, of course. Um, and in the end, after certain iterations of either of those things, uh, it gets very muddled and very confusing. Either we forget uh, what defaults are resetting, what defaults are coming from the, um, the construct itself, which defaults are coming from the service. Um, and we have to look in the code every time, uh, or we end up with a construct that's basically passing everything. So it's not really an abstraction anymore. It's just a different name for the original level two construct. Um, both of those things will lead to confusion, frustration. It will be hard to know what to use, and it will be even harder to predict uh, what we actually are going to, de to be deploying. So some lessons uh, that we learned from that and, and from running into that problem a few times. Uh, one of them is uh, try not to do it. Uh, and instead, uh, well, try not to create abstractions when they are not needed. Uh, it's a bit harder to, like, in general, not run into problems. Um, there are some other ways to make sure that you have the right configuration inside your resources that don't require you creating another uh, abstraction that might make things more confusing for people using it because they won't know do you have to use that abstracted bucket or do you have to use the default S3 bucket. Uh, if you um, always have them use the default S3 bucket, but have a different tool that then can check the properties, uh, you can have both things. Uh, so a few ways to do this. Again, you can write example code. That's always a good place to start. Uh, if you can highlight like these are things that are important, this uh, is a way to configure it. Um, gives um, the users a very easy place to start because they can look at that example code and start using it. Also gives them an, an easy way to know what they are configuring. So you have that mechanical sympathy in there. And it's a very uh, easy way to break away from that if you would have an edge case where that uh, default wouldn't fit with their use case. Uh, of course, that also depends a bit on whether it's a, a governance thing or just something that you think should be a default. Uh, on top of that, you can use tools like uh, CFN Lint, the Cloud Formation Linter, CFN Guard, CFN NAC, that can scan out the Synthet templates um, and they can flag non-compliant resources. So they can either have their own rules or you can write your, you can write, uh, your rules yourself. And they can say, oh, you're uh, creating an IAM policy that has a wildcard in it, that's not allowed. You're creating an S3 bucket that's not encrypted, that's not allowed. Uh, please fix that. Uh, and finally, you can do similar things using the CDK aspects. So you can uh, scan every S3 bucket that gets created inside your CDK code and then throw an error if it's not following your governance guidelines. And in all these cases, you keep that configuration visible to the person that's actually responsible for that configuration. So uh, you're not doing anything magic and they will actually know what they're uh, setting up. There might still be places where you actually want to create an abstraction. I'm not saying that abstractions are bad. Uh, they have a place, uh, but there are some things that I try to check before I start creating one and to make sure that they make sense. Uh, the first is I should be able to give it a name. Uh, a construct named encrypted bucket um, is much better than a construct named my bucket even if they do the same thing because the encrypted bucket is clear this is going to be encrypted and you will never have to change that property to non-encrypted because then it's not an, an not an encrypted bucket anymore on top of, on top of that they should do one thing generally so it's better to have a construct static website and then a separate construct static website with authentication than to have both constructs and then have conditions in there and, and se selects and if statements that would create confusion about what is the default thing that should be created. And, and finally, abstractions are hard. It's hard to write good, good abstractions and sometimes it's better to be explicit in the stack and use the level one and level two constructs than to hide a lot of things behind an abstraction that then will leak or cause confusion. And since I'm almost out of time, or actually just over time, out of time, a summary of all the things that I did wrong. 
Uh, I did all, didn't always put in uh, thought about mechanical sympathy. I was too clever. I, I hit too much. Um, I made mistakes with custom resources. Um, and I should have treated them as separate applications and deployed them like that. Uh, CloudFormation features are, are very nice to use. Uh, it's not because we're using CDK that uh, we shouldn't use CloudFormation features and keeping up with that uh, can actually be a, a, an increase of flexibility. And finally, we conclude with a general story about how abstractions are hard. Uh, there are also some mistakes that I didn't fit in, the, in this talk, mostly because of time. Uh, one thing that I want to highlight is every time there's something that has side effects or retrieve states, there is a risk introduced. Uh, I have a few stories around that as well. Uh, the CDK context.json uh, helps a little bit, little bit with that, but just like with the uh, being clever reflex of, am I doing the right thing? Um, every time you call an external API, it might be a good moment to reflect, is this actually a thing that I want to do? Or is, this, um, is there another way that I, I can achieve the same thing without having to save state uh, inside of my CDK app? So thank you all for listening. Uh, my name is Ben, it's still Ben. I will stick around for nine more minutes uh, for questions and uh, discussions. Uh, if you'd like to contact me uh, or Cloudar, all the information is on the screen right now. I will stick around in the uh, chat as well uh, to uh, have more discussions about this and the other things happening on CDK Day. Um, very shortly about Cloudar. We're a uh, premier AWS consulting partner and an AWS managed service provider. So uh, we can help with anything that's AWS related. And that's from billing to full management of your AWS environment and everything that fits in between that. So thanks again. And I hope we'll, hopefully I can see you all soon in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, Eric, you're muted. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I know. So... Oh, yeah. No, no <laughs> errors happen. <laughs> we just learned this. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for this um, very interesting topic about mistakes we all make and never um, think they might happen. Otherwise, it wouldn't be mistakes. So if you have any questions, um, put it uh, in the chat or in the CTK dev uh, um, Slack, and we'll be happy to relay them to Ben to, yeah. See what yeah, I see a question about the uh, like. I'm just going to dive into the, the yeah. bottom ones that I see because Jump I yeah. didn't see the uh, everything before that. I see a question about building the CFN private resource types with CDK. I don't have an example of that uh, handy, but uh, the way I would do it is you can use the um, the cloud permission CLI that will help you set up your uh, private resource type and. Uh, define your schema and how it will interact with CloudFormation. And then you can build your own uh, level one construct around that and use it uh, in CloudFormation like that. And since the um, private resource types are also deployable with CloudFormation, you, I assume they're also supporting CDK to do the, to do the, the, to do the deploy with CDK itself. So you can write it just like you write any other application. Like if you're using, for example, um, NPM that also has some installers and that might install software, use CloudFormation CLI like that, that will build out a zip and then you can build that zip uh, and deploy it as an asset um, inside of uh, CloudFormation. Yeah, and to um, elaborate on this, um, I think yesterday Mauricio um, added a video on how to use L1s for custom resources. So um, I think if I can find the, the video link and post it to the Slack. So there's a statement here by uh, Jean, Jean Gazda. It says, one useful advice, don't start implementing CDK in your company by trying to create a framework for your teams. Spend the time teaching the teams how to write good CDK. That's just good advice. A any framework yes. you're using, that's just really good advice. So, and yeah, it, well it's very tempting with the power of the CDK to say, oh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a massive amount of constructs to fill like every use case. Um, and like, I completely agree with that. Instead of doing that, just write one simple example of using the level one, level two constructs, and then go to the teams and explain what that's doing, because they will be managing not only the CDK code, which you can simplify, but they will be responsible for everything running in the cloud as well. And um, if you simplify that and hide that away, then you're just making it harder for them instead of easier. That's right, that's right. Uh, 
We had a question out here from Brian, and, and I don't think you'd be able to cover all this, but do you have any good resources? Can you provide an overview of all the CFN options, custom resources, <laughs> private types, modules, macros? Ben, go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, if you need something custom, first thing that you should look at custom resources, The uh, sorry, the private types. Pri if you can use a private type, use a private type. Uh, there are some use cases where they might not fit yet. In that case, you can go for custom resources. Um, and those are like, I want to create a thing. So a resource is part of that. Uh, the other things that exist are modules, and that's very similar to CDK constructs. So that's, I have a group of things and I want to give them a simple name. Um, so uh, for example, that might be also a way to work together between teams using uh, SAM and teams using uh, CDK is that you can create a cloud formation, con a cloud formation module that both teams can use. Um, and then you also have macros and macros um, are sometimes a bit tricky because they actually introduce uh, some more variants inside of your templates. So macros run before the template gets deployed, but inside of cloud formation. So you write a Lambda function that gets the uh, template passed to it can do any transformation with it, returns another template. Uh, you can verify that the template that it's uh, created is correct. And then you can say, deploy this template. So it's somewhere in between that. Um, again, if you can avoid macros, it's, it's probably better because they just like introducing the um, external state in your CDK app, they introduce a certain amount of uncertainty and risk because now you're running custom code, uh, just like you're running custom code in your CDK or might be running custom code in your CDK if you're not just using the constructs, but you're putting ifs and loops in there. Uh, every every line of code that you write is a, a chance of making a mistake. Uh -huh. So if you can avoid writing pieces of code and you can fix it another way by, for example, using resource types or by restructuring your templates, uh, that's probably a better way to go about it. I've always said the most brittle part of an application is my code. That's, that's yeah, exactly. Be introduced. Yeah. So I have another question here. Um, in in it says in what uh, in what is best practice in using one level one CFN constructors or two level two constructors? Uh, I'm going to leave this to the CDK experts. I, I'm personally a little more versed in cloud formation, but uh, I assume if the level two construct is stable, I would use those. If they're unstable, I would stick with the level one ones. Um, <laughs> Just because that applies you don't to anything. Want... <laughs> if it works, yes. use it. If it doesn't, don't use it. <laughs> well, no, it's not if it works. If, yeah. if the chance, like the the hard thing about constructs, whether you write them or the level two constructs, yeah. is that it's very hard to predict what will change. For example, if you look at um, the GP two and three volumes, uh, if you have a level two construct that would be creating a disk by default. And it's creating it with GP2 right now, even though CloudFormation might be still creating GP1. Um, and you that will switch to GP3 at some point, maybe. That whether doesn't really matter who who's writing that resource, that introduces a risk because that depending how that's configured might be an instance replacement. And that's that the risk of that happening with level one constructs is very low because CloudFormation guarantees if the template works right now, it's going to be keep working. That's that's the API is stable. For the level two constructs, there are levels of stabil stability and there's like a lot of effort put in there to not break things. Um, but every time you update dependencies, you will have to check whether there are actually changes there or not. Yeah, that's, uh, that's but cool. yeah, I, I would lose, use level two if, if possible. Uh, you can see on the CDK website, uh, if they're still experimental, in that case, probably avoid it for production apps that you are hard to recreate. Uh, but if they're stable there, um, I would probably use a level two once because otherwise uh, there's not a lot of, well, there's still some added value in CDK, but or um, you lose a lot of the value there. Yeah. Perfect. And there was one more question. Maybe you can answer it on CDK Slack because we are out of time, but you were tagged in it. so. With this, thanks, Ben, for sharing your mistakes. And we will You're welcome. directly go over to the next topic. Matt will talk about creating verifiable JSON web tokens using the CDK. And I'm very happy to see what he is talking about. Hey, I'm Matt Martz. I'm a lead engineer at PowerSchool and an AWS community builder. And I'm here to talk to you about creating verifiable JSON web tokens with CDK, or really 
how to secure your grocery lists. So the Marts family stores our uh, grocery lists in JSON web token format, like everyone else. The problem is we don't actually verify the, to the tokens. So uh, someone could swap out the token on the fridge and include things like candy or junk food, and we wouldn't really be able to tell. So let's spin up a CDK stack that will sign the jots and serve the key store so the jots can be verified. The stack's going to consist of a REST API, a, secrets a secret and secrets manager, and an S3 bucket. There's also three lambdas. One of these lambdas is going to be invoked by a custom resource, and that's going to be used to generate the public and private keys and store them in S3 and secrets manager, respectively. Another lambda is going to uh, read the secret and generate the jot using it, and the other is going to use an AWS integration with S3 to get the key store and actually verify it. So to set up the project, we are going to use Progen. Progen is really handy for uh, setting up proof of concept projects. You can run this, this command and pretty much it, it, it gets spun up very quickly. Uh, then we're going to, we just need to install a couple extra dependencies. So in this case, we're going to install these and this will take care of everything that we need for the rest of the project. Once the dependencies are installed, uh, we're going to create the S3 bucket and the secret. These are only a couple lines of code. Uh, creating the secret's really easy. Basically just give it a secret ID. And then the bucket itself uh, follows the same pattern as other buckets. One thing I want to point out is this auto delete objects. Auto delete objects, when you destroy the stack, will actually create a custom resource that will empty the bucket before trying to delete it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to destroy the bucket if there are stuff still inside of it. So very useful. In order to generate the keys, we need to create a custom resource. Uh, this is going to generate the key store and store the private key in Secrets Manager and the public key in S3. The, we, don't want to, we don't want the keys this to generate the key store every time we deploy the stack, so we're going to use for custom resource versioning. Basically what this does is uh, every, every time the stack deploys, it's going to check the stuff inside of properties and if like the version ch version changes, it will re-execute the custom resource. So if I keep it at two forever, it's only going to do it the first time it goes out. Uh, creating lambdas in CDK are pretty straightforward. Um, we're going to give it some, lamb some lambdas. We're going to use Node.js function because it's super easy. You don't have to install. Uh, I, I like using TypeScript, so we it just uses ES build to bundle. Uh, and if you install that natively, it's very fast. So we're going to create the Node.js function, uh, give it access to write to the secret, and give it access to write to the bucket that we created earlier. The once the key store is created, it then actually writes it. It's a really this is a really simple handler function. Uh, it gets the secrets manager from the AWS SDK. And it gets the S3. It gets the S3 client from AWS SDK, and that it uses the create key, key store functionality to store both the secret and the public key, respectively. So we're we're going to store the public key in a JWKS.json file in the bucket, and really that's going to be the only file that's in that bucket. But we'll we'll use that later. For now, we're going to use the secret to create the jot. Uh, we want a REST endpoint that we can post to that will basically encode whatever payload we give it and sign it with the secret that we just created. So in order to do that, we're going to uh, create the REST API, create the encoder function, and grant it access to read the secret. And then we're just going to add the resource and method for the Lambda integration. The signing of the actual token is, is easy in that it just takes the event body and uses that as the token payload, and it gets this, the secret value from Secrets Manager and just signs it. Uh, from there, it, it returns the signed token, and you have a uh, valid jot. So this is what that looks like. When, once the code is deployed, you can make a, post, a curl post, or use Postman or anything else for that matter, and uh, include the grocery list, and it will get encoded into this jot. So if you were to take this and put it into like jot.io or whatever, uh, you'll see the grocery list here. But we're not actually verifying it. 
And, but you know that that's been fine for now. We haven't haven't really had too many slip ups uh, with the Mart's family grocery list. But I think Veronica may have overheard me tell mom that we weren't verifying the signatures, so she figured out how to uh, just generate her own jot. So that's pretty easy to do. Uh, you can go to a lot of websites, just gen copy copy the original token, make some slight modifications, and replace healthy stuff with candy. And it looks the same. I mean, we weren't verifying it before. Uh, looks good to me, right? So let's fix that. Uh, we're going to serve up the key store. So serving up the key store is actually pretty neat. So we stored the public key in S3. Uh, Instead of having like a Lambda return it or something like that, what we can do is we can create an AWS integration uh, using some of the CDK stuff. So we're gonna create a role. Uh, you, you need to create a role and basically it gets assumed by API gateway and we're going to grant it access to the bucket. Then we create the AWS integration and it's for the S3 service. So the role credential, the role credentials go here uh, we're just going to give it a simple path like this. We only want it to access this one file. Uh, you can wildcard these and get it so that uh, you have an AWS integration for S3 that you can use to access a lot of files, but we only want it to do this single file. And then uh, something important to note is integration responses. Integration responses are required in this case. Uh, if you don't include this, what will happen is the API Gateway will be able to get the file from S3, but it's not expecting a, a 200 response from S3, so it's actually going to replace it with a 400 and you don't get your file. Uh, you, you could see this in the API Gateway console by actually test invoking the endpoint. You'll see it gets successfully gets the, uh, the S3 file, but then if you were to actually make the curl request to get the, the key store, uh, you'd get a 400. It, it was pretty frustrating in troubleshoot, but you need this step. And then we just define the endpoint. So in order to actually verify the job, we need to create the decoder lambda. Uh, what that's going to do is, normally you wouldn't do this, uh, <laughs> but for the sake of demo, we're actually going to pass in the key store URL that we actually want to use to verify. Normally this would be encoded in your lambda, and it would only be coming from one place. It would probably be an environment variable or something. But uh, for ease, we're passing it in. So what this Lambda is going to do is it's going to uh, read the, it, it's going to hit the key store URL, get the, get the keys, and it's going to look for the key ID that's encoded in the token. And if it's not there, uh, well, it wasn't signed by that key store. So now if we pass in the grocery list, the good one comes back and just returns back the actual grocery list that we should have. Whereas the bad one returns an error and it's like, well, we didn't sign this. So now we know Veronica was trying to add something to the list and we shouldn't use that. Now, I know it's hard to believe, but we don't actually use jots for our grocery lists. Um, but it, it's really easy to set this kind of stuff up. So Verify your jots. Uh, also, I strongly recommend using ESBuild uh, with Node.js function. Make sure you install ESBuild locally. It works super fast. It's great. Uh, and then I think the other thing I pointed out was the auto-delete objects in S3 uh, also for the S3 buckets. Also very useful to when you're destroying your stacks. Uh, the slides for this, the blog post that goes with it, and the code are all have all been tweeted out by now. So uh, thanks for watching my presentation. All right, Melissa, how are you doing? I'm on mute. That's <laughs> all right. I'm here. Hi. So I already feel like I have so much new stuff to go and try out with all that's coming out today. And me and my very elementary CDK, there is so much for me to go and try out. That was a really awesome talk by Matt. I really enjoyed that. And uh, are we going to check out for questions quickly before we move on to the next talk? Is there any questions in the chat? 
Yeah, I think Matt's actually in the in the Slack channel a answering questions uh, on this as well. So, okay, so we're gonna move right along then. So I'm already saying new stuff for me to go and learn. I'm looking forward to the next talk. We got coming up Sebastian, and he's gonna talk to us about JSII progen for writing your CDK constructs. So that's on with the next talk. I'm looking forward to that. So Eric. Uh, yep. Here we go. Welcome to my talk, Enjoy Writing CDK Constructs Using Progen and JSII. My name is Sebastian, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about the experiences I made after writing some CDK constructs. Before we start, there is a yeah, step-by-step -step tutorial that I have written in order to yeah, provide you with all the details and the different steps that you need to take in order to accomplish that. Um, so yeah, please, if you're interested, please have a look at the GitHub repository that I provide here. Um, it covers a lot more details than what I can share with you here in this small talk. Okay, uh, as you might know, um, Project comes with a lot of good defaults uh, if you want to write some CDK code. Uh, for example, it um, has a consistent CDK versioning for dependencies and a lot of other things, especially um, the handling of JSII uh, is pretty neat, um, and we will cover that also in a few minutes. If you want to do that and you want to translate your constructs into different languages, you need to take care of some small details that uh, are important when the code is translated into other languages. So for example, here we have some uh, construct that accepts some properties and I have provided two different ways how you can write the, uh, the properties and they translate differently into the other languages. So for example, if you take those struct properties here uh, in Java, they will create a interface and they will create a default implementation and a builder that helps the users of your constructs to yeah, build uh, this data container that contains, I don't know, some feature flags uh, or some other input values. On the other side, if you use this um, behavior properties, that will only contain the interface itself, but not more. And JSII is deciding what is being uh, compiled uh, by looking at the name of the interface. So it, the naming conventions here, if you use an uppercase I, it assumes that this um, interface is a behavior interface. So the user of your construct would need to implement it and provide all the boilerplate code by themselves. On the other side, those struct properties, they just act like a data container, like a struct. Um, so it's much easier than to provide some values in the end in the other languages. So keep that in mind. Um, there are quite a few more restrictions. Um, I encourage you to have a look into the article that I link at the bottom of this slide. Um, yeah, because there you will find a lot more information for that. Then the next part, versioning. That's always important, and especially if you write your own CDK constructs. Um, and Prozen, Prozen provides um, or uses a tool in, in the background that is following the conventional commit standard. So uh, what it means is it will take a look at the git commit, git commit message that you provide. And based on that, it will bump the version for you. So for example, if you include a fix colon and then the message, it will create a patch release of your CDK construct. And similarly, if you write something a feed colon and then the message, it will create a minor release. So for example, if you add a new feature and if you include a breaking change in your git commit message, git commit, git commit message, um, it will create a major release. That's yeah, pretty handy and it automates a lot of things. Also, it also creates a change log automatically, so you don't need to write that um, by yourself. Um, however, you need to be aware that this feature exists um, because I didn't really know that before and I didn't read the documentation. Uh, so yeah, I just got, discovered it um, a little bit late, uh, but I really like it because it um, helps me to automate a lot more than, uh, than what, it, what it's already doing. All right, uh, the next point is you probably need to include uh, Lambda functions at some point. And yeah, uh, so you need to put your code somewhere in your repository. 
Um, so that could either be uh, like into your source folder, uh, you could include um, your TypeScript code if you're writing your Lambda function in TypeScript, or um, it might also make sense in some cases if you write um, the code in a different language, like for example, Python, you don't want to include it in the source folder. Uh, I don't know, because you um, do some XR processing or whatever. Um, technically, it doesn't really matter. Uh, from the perspective of that you should keep your code together, like if you have your construct that is using a certain Lambda function code, you also probably want to, to take this close together, um, depending on the size of your construct. That's up to you. Um, there is, however, one point where it might be important, and that is um, if you, for example, also include external dependencies. Um, and there are multiple ways how you can um, how you can then instruct such uh, Lambda functions or the code for it. So one thing is you could use, for example, the Node.js function construct that's coming with the AWS CDK. Uh, in that case, you could say, um, uh, I have my Node.js function and it's at a certain place. Uh, and this Node.js function construct is taking care of bundling the uh, dependencies for you. Um, so in the end, if a user is using your construct, uh, this, const, this Node.js con function construct will make sure uh, to create a Lambda artifact for you if you're using TypeScript or JavaScript um, in, uh, in this Lambda function code. And then that will be used as the Lambda function code in the end. However, I think the big disadvantage here is that <clears throat> this build process only starts when uh, yeah, your CDK construct is used. Um, so for example, if it's used in a certain stack or app, um, and I think um, this has too many assumptions on the environment of your users, uh, because um, this construct will that only work if either ESBuild or Docker are available on your uh, in the environment of your users of your constructs. Um, what I like to do there is I would I like to pre-build or pre-package my um, my Lambda function artifacts if I'm writing them in, for example, TypeScript or JavaScript. And here you can use something like this, so you can extend the compile task workflow that Progen is creating, and you could say. I also want to compile the Lambda function code of, um, yeah, of my Lambda function, and you can push it then into the, the slip folder, which is used as uh, the like the target or dist folder uh, for JSII before it packages your um, your construct code, and then in the end you could just say in your construct, um, okay, here's my function, and at at that point uh, there's the code for it uh, that's being used, and that's it. So then you just pre build your Lambda function code and the user doesn't have to do this on their system. But you can do a lot more with this approach. So um, you can also extend, for example, in Progen, you can extend the build task uh, or the, the build process, for example, by um, providing further commands. Um, or you can also adjust the release workflow by adding further jobs. For example, it can send a notification to your Slack channel to say, hey, I've released something. Uh, or you can also cr um, create your own GitHub uh, action workflows. Um, it's basically fully cust customizable what you can do. Of course, you can't customize everything uh, in Progen, uh, but you can do a lot of good things in order to adjust it to your own needs. And now the important part about JSII compilation. So in order to, uh, to start that, uh, that you can translate your CDK construct into uh, different languages and then push it to other repositories. You need to provide this configuration here, uh, for example, publish to Maven, publish to NuGet uh, or PyPy. <clears throat> and there you need to provide a few more IDs and properties uh, and namespace or package. And that's it, what, um, what JSII needs as the basic configuration. Um, and then you only need to provide some repository secrets. <laughs> that's, as you can see, quite a huge list. However, um, it's, I think it's pretty obvious what you need to do here. So you need to provide a token or API key or user, username and password. Um, however, there's one thing that's maybe not so obvious. That's this uh, staging profile ID for Maven. And you can figure this out if you log in to the Nexus repository manager on, on the Maven repository. And then you need to read this um, ID from the URL. And that's what you need to provide in your um, repository secret. And that's then picked up by JSII. Um, yeah, and if you've done all of that, the release process kicks in. And as you can see, so it's actually quite fast. So Maven is usually the, the slowest <laughs> process uh, because it just takes some more time to uh, yeah, compile and bundle everything in Java. Uh, 
but yeah, as you can see, within three, uh, within five or six minutes, uh, you have published your CDK constructs to multiple repositories, and that's really cool. It works just out of the box. And then there's another small cool feature that I really like. It's that um, if you provide some example code in your README file, um, this will also get translated into other languages. So for example, here's this function example. This will get translated into, into this Python code automatically. So um, JSII is picking that up. If you provide this code uh, using the, this, this code command in, in Markdown and then you annotate it using as the TypeScript language, and then JSII will pick this up and yeah, compile it for you. That's pretty cool. And based on that, you can write a lot of good CDK constructs. Um, here are some further links that you might want to have a look at, uh, also the ones that I mentioned before in, in the, in, on the other slides. And uh, yeah, I hope you learned something now from my experience. If you have some further questions or, or just want to connect with me, uh, add me on LinkedIn and ask some questions or tell me what cool things you have built. Thanks for listening. Bye. Hi, fellow CDK developers. Ever worried you might be introducing a bug in your code that could affect your infrastructure? Finding it hard to trust using third-party constructs in an application that's continuously deployed by a pipeline? Ever felt unsure about what new CDK code actually does? Introducing C2A, a tool to gain insight into and take control of the changes deployed by CDK updates. This tool is an open source project developed by me, a master's student, with the help of the CDK team that lets you view the effective infrastructure changes before deploying, along with how risky they may be. And because I know that risky doesn't mean the same for everyone, this categorization is fully customizable by you, your team, or your company. And while having this extra information already sounds great, we're taking it a step further. In the same way that you can categorize the changes, you can also pre-approve the ones that you know that meet your standards. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, I need your help to validate this concept. You'll also be helping the CDK team offer you the best experience, contributing to a better ecosystem, and of course, help guide the direction of a new tool. If you'd be willing to take 30 to 45 minutes of your time in late May to give me some feedback, please go on bit.ly slash c2a-cdk and leave your contact information. Your participation is crucial for the future of this project and will be greatly appreciated. See you soon. Yeah. Thanks, Sebastian, for this talk. And I'm so sorry that we don't have interpreters for this short sequence because it's full screen, but check out the link and um, it's an interesting approach done by an intern on the CDK team. So Willisba, what are we going to hear about next? I'm still backstage. No, you're on, on screen. Okay, I think we have some technical things here. Okay, Willis was on stage, but I'm not sure if she can hear us. My internet is very unstable. Yeah, so... That's okay. Thorsten, you're about okay. to go ahead and announce it. Let's do yeah. it. So um, the next thing will be an interesting talk about orchestrating serverless bioinformatics by Joshua and Kyle. So let's kick it off. Let's do it. Everyone. My name is Josh Burneman, and I work at the Institute of Genomic Medicine at Nationwide Children's Hospital here in Columbus, Ohio. Today, my colleague Kyle Vojtovich and I are going to talk about orchestrating serverless bioinformatics workflows with CDK, and more importantly, how we use CDK to simplify the DevOps required for running our large-scale genomic pipelines in AWS. At IGM, we run different analyses on the genome. This includes identifying genetic variants in tumors and diagnosing rare diseases. We accomplish this by using three separate in-house services. On the top here, we have IGM Primary, which deals with sequencer information conversion, Churchill, our DNA analysis toolkit, and Varhouse, an annotation database for millions of variants that help our clinicians and researchers conduct their downstream interpretations. Today, we're just gonna focus on the DevOps for Churchill. While developing Churchill infrastructure in AWS, 
we had a few goals. We wanted to redesign our pipelines as microservices and implement them as serverless applications. This would inherently mean that we would be able to scale our applications on demand and pay for what we use while moving away from our older monolithic design. We also wanted to provide an easy way to deploy containerized applications for our scientific developers. And many of our biological applications are versioned so that they can be run in a clinical setting or later reproduced for literature. So the question is, why did we use CDK? Well, we already had developers who could code in Python and JavaScript. The object-oriented design also allows us to develop reusable constructs for many diverse use cases and analyses in comparison to standard JSON and YAML. We can then write unit tests on our constructs and assert IAM permissions as well. We were able to deploy our version, versioned applications as CloudFormation stacks, uh, which means that they can be easily deprecated or redeployed at will. We were able to utilize all these advantages of CDK to deploy different services for Churchill. We have a construct, the simple Churchill service, that has been written to support many of the cloud resources that run our containers uh, or images in ECR serverlessly. An example of the simple Chur Churchill service in action is setting up the resources for running compute heavy batch jobs, like assembling the genome, like a puzzle, or managing hundreds of smaller to medium-sized jobs that calculate quality control metrics on the data in parallel. The simple Churchill service custom construct child class uses the AWS batch job definition construct to run an existing Docker image in ECR on managed compute environments or Fargate. It creates Lambda functions via the AWS Lambda function construct to transform client input into Docker commands. And finally, an AWS step function state machine or a CFN state machine construct to orchestrate the Lambda functions and batch jobs uh, also in the stack. The state machine class depends on whether the definition is an Amazon states language uh, JSON string or a native CDK iChainable child object. The CDK Python code is an intuitive extension over the Docker code, so our scientists also have an insight into how their pipelines are uh, being orchestrated. Finally, we're able to use um, the object-oriented design and custom functions to develop, um, to build our constructs. Um, for example, in the image on the slide, we wrote a class method that will render an Amazon States language formatted JSON file which is written as a Jinja2 template, um, Jinja2, the Python library. Another example would be to supply logic for creating batch job definitions with either Fargate or EC2 compute using a Boolean flag. Using this architecture, we can now deploy all of our individual scientific pipelines to new stacks by using a simple command, CDK deploy. As you see in the image on the right, each of the bioinformatics services uh, one and two have different stacks per version. Next, Kyle will cover how we put this all together. Hi, this is Kyle. I'm going to give you an overview of the higher level resources that we use to coordinate the execution of the services that Josh talked about. As an overview, we have this large application that we call Churchill, which consists of many smaller services which perform alignment, bearing calling, QC, and more. In order to coordinate all these individual services and allow users to kick them off, we created a REST API. The REST API was created using the REST API construct, and users can submit JSON messages to the API in order to kick off Churchill executions. So on the top right of the screen, you can see the block of JSON with the list of services that the user wants to run, some input parameters, and a list of samples with data about those samples. 
The API then processes the request in the Lambda function and passes it to a global state machine, which then calls and coordinates the execution of the individual services. As you see here, users can kick off specific versions of the services that they want to run. So in this case, the user ran version 1.1 of Bioservice 1 and 2.0 of Bioservice 2, allowing different users to kick off different versions through the same AP endpoint supports two of our main use cases. So number one, we support the execution of validated pipelines on clinical hospital data. So we go through a validation process and we pick a set of versions and then we want to lock, lo lock those down so we can run the same software on our data to be consistent. Our other use case is that we want to support research applications where we update our services more rapidly and run the latest and greatest tools on our data. You can see in the diagram on the right side that our state machine also sends events to EventBridge during execution. So as new data becomes available when the service is complete, events are sent to EventBridge during the execution, and this allows our downstream service Varhouse to, to start and run its execution whenever the data it needs is available regardless of whether or not the whole Churchill pipeline is complete. This leads to the next point. In the future, we're thinking of including an event-driven design for Churchill itself instead of this global state machine. So our scientists have created more and more services using this uh, simple Churchill service construct, and we're up to about seven right now, and there are more planned services to add to our pipeline. Because of the, the number of services, it's actually a little difficult to maintain the overall global state machine. So we're thinking of using a similar design as Varhouse, in which um, each service starts execution whenever data that it needs is available. So we'll track the metadata in a DynamoDB table and then um, send events through the services. And then downstream services can kick off whenever, whenever new data is available. We're hoping that this can help maintainability in this large application, but we're still in the early stages, so we're still exploring the idea more right now. Another future direction, we want to use CDK pipelines for our continuous integration and continuous development, because currently we have some in-house constructs to create those resources, code pipeline, code build, and so on. And it, it'll be more convenient once CDK pipelines gets a little more mature. So we're excited for that. Well, thanks for listening. If you have any questions about bioinformatics or about the CDK work that we're doing, I'm sure you can message us through Slack. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for this interesting talk about orchestrating serverless bioinformatics. So and without further ado, we will directly switch over to our next speaker, Max, being live with us and talking about CDKs. So having more than the AWS CDK and having more CDKs out there. So the stage is yours. All right, thanks. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, we'll jump right into the topic. CDKs, uh, the future of Kubernetes application deployments, question mark, revisited. Uh, we'll clarify the, the title uh, in a few minutes. At first, let's have a look at the agenda. Uh, so I will give a short introduction about myself. So who's talking, then we'll clarify uh, what CDKs is about. Um, then we'll have a look at what, what has happened since the last pretty much year, and we'll see uh, what's to come. 
All right, at first, a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Max. Uh, on the internet, you will find me under my nickname Brenner M most of the time. I'm a freelance DevOps engineer, uh, mainly focusing on Kubernetes and cloud infrastructure. Right now, that's AWS. Um, you can find uh, me coding on GitHub and as well as writing on my blog. Um, I also did a blog post um, pretty much like uh, roughly a year ago about uh, CDKs. And that's also one of the main reasons I'm pretty much here today. So I revisited it um, this year um, pretty much for this talk. And yeah, next to that, I'm also um, riding motorcycles and bikes, as you may have guessed from my background. Um, and I do also some sports in my free time. Okay, let's jump into the actual topic. CD Cates, what, what is it? Um, starting with a quote from the uh, website. So CD Cates is a web software development framework for defining Kubernetes applications and reusable ab abstractions using familiar programming languages and rich object-oriented APIs. Okay, uh, long sentence. What does it actually mean? Uh, so, um, to, to explore that, let's let's have a look at the evolution of um, writing Kubernetes manifests. So initially there was like plain YAML manifests. Um, if you've worked with Q Q Kubernetes, you pretty much know them. So that are just plain YAML files. Then um, customize came around, which um, yeah, extended the concept a little bit um, with override files and env environment files so that you were able to um, yeah, kind of template your, your um, manifests. Then one of the most popular tool around since a few years, Helm, uh, right now Helm 3, uh, which extended this concept a little bit even further. So now you have a real uh, templating engine, the Go templating engine. So you can use like programming constructs like if, um, if else branches or conditionals or uh, loops. And yeah, now we are at CDKs, which brings the whole stuff to a pretty much next level. So you can use real programming languages, mostly object oriented, at least right now, uh, like Python, Java, and um, JavaScript or TypeScript, and um, define your Kubernetes um, manifests with these. Okay, so um, having a look at where we come from, so that's pretty much like the plain YAML manifest that I was talking about. Um, in this example, it's a deployment. Um, you give it a you use a version, you give it a kind, you give it a name, you give it a replica count, in this case two. Um, you will do the whole um, labeling magic so the replica controller knows um, what, what pods it should take care about. And then you define your containers, giving it a name and an image. So how does this look in CDKs? Um, so in CDKs, everything starts with a chart. I will go over what's that in a minute. Then you give uh, define just a variable here. Um, it's a dictionary defining our label. By the way, that's Python code, as you may have guessed it already. Um, I will also show some, some other languages uh, in the next minutes. So yet again, we, will, we are deploying a deployment um, in this case, you can see the, the class that we are using here is coming from the KLS namespace. So that's pretty much what, what um, CDKLS um, yeah, delivers us. Then we give our deployment a name. Yet again, a replica. We'll do the whole um, label management. And we define a container. And then we define a so-called app. I will also go over this concept in a minute. We add our chart to it, and then we execute the so-called synth. Synth stands for synthesize, so that's pretty much the function that takes our uh, Python code, in this case, and transfers it into uh, the manifest file, so YAML files. OK, so going over the concepts of CDKs. At first, we have an app. Um, the app is pretty much just a container for multiple or a single chart. And it's the entry point for, for the synthesizing, just uh, the, the function call I just showed. Um, so there's also some configuration that you can do here. So for example, the output directory, uh, where the synthesization will, um, yeah, will put the files in. That's something you can set here. Then there are charts. Um, don't confuse them with, with um, Helm charts. They're kind of similar, but also something else. Um, so there are container for constructs. I will explain the term in, in a second. And what's what's pretty important about uh, a single chart will always result in a single Kubernetes manifest. So if you have like multiple resources that you want to aggregate into a single manifest, um, put them all in one chart and they will result in one file. 
Also, you can def declare some global values here. So, for example, in Kubernetes namespace, you want to put the resources in or some labels. Okay, coming to constructs, if you're familiar with some of the other CDKs, you pretty much know this term already. Um, in the Kubernetes world, there are um, yeah, two, two levels of constructs. The le level one constructs are the, those being auto-generated and automatically de being delivered by Kubernetes. And then there are um, level two um, constructs, which are abstractions on top of um, level ones. What does that mean? Or what does that look like? Let's let's have a look at an example. So we have a web servers uh, construct here. By the way, that's types TypeScript code. Um, the concepts are the same for all the programming languages. Um, I'm just trying to show a little bit of variance here. So we are inheriting the construct class. Um, we are do doing some construction constructor magic. Um, and then we are setting some variables here. Um, as you can see in the constructor, you, we passed an options object into the, the class or into the constructor. So um, we can pretty much choose the values from, from there, or if they're not defined, we can deploy the, declare some default values. So here we are defining the port, the container port, the label, the number of replicas, stuff like that. And then what, what you usually need for a web service on Kubernetes with, that you usually deploy is at least a service and the cube deployment. So that's what you need. And that's what we declare within this web service. So it's some kind of abstraction over a service and the deployment, and it will um, pretty much like remove all the boilerplate code that you would normally need. And you can reuse it for all of your web services. Okay, um, next part is the CLI. Um, installation is pretty simple. So the CLI is a node module that you can usually install like all the other tools with yarn or npm and then there are three sub commands first one is, is init so this one starts a new project here it's also the point where you decide for your programming language of choice then there's import this is for importing the um yeah level one uh, constructs for kubernetes or you can also import your crds um, so if you have custom resources that you use in your projects then you can create um classes that you can then use with your cdk cdk's code from those crds and the third command is the synth command already explained that that pretty much takes your code and converts it into yaml manifests so let's have a look at the overall workflow um pretty much like um yeah we are using the cli so it, it starts with the init command in this case we are we our programming language of choice is python so we execute cdk's init python app uh, which will then take care of everything. Then it prints a nice help me message, which explains how to continue. Um, here you can pretty much see all the files that it's, that it's um, generating. This differs from um, programming language to programming language. Then we um, yeah, add our CDKs code. I will expect here that we um, add the deployment code from above, for example. Then we execute the synth code, which, which will result in a YAML manifest being generated. And then we can deploy this YAML manifest onto our Kubernetes cluster. That's how you usually do it. The other way is you can also tell the synth command to print to STD out, and then you can pipe the output directly into kubectl apply. Yeah. Okay, now that we know what, what CDK is about, uh, let's have a look at what's new. Um, starting with Helm support. Um, yeah, at first, a little shout out to Matthew Bonick. Um, this has been an external contribution from him. So as far as I know, he's not part of the uh, CDK's team, but he uh, pretty much implemented the Helm support on his own. Um, thanks for that. I really like it. Um, I will also explain why in a second. So as usual, we will start with a with the chart. And now instead of generating or writing our own um, constructs here, we will use the Helm construct, which will then refer to a Helm chart. This can either be a Helm chart from a package directory uh, registry as you are used to it. So in this example, the, the Redis chart, and then you can pass values, work with it like with every other Helm chart, or it can also be like a local Helm chart that you have in your disk. 
Uh, and what's really cool about um, the Helm support, which which I really like, um, I think if you've worked with Helm before, then you met that point where you use the Helm chart from some, some third party component, and then you you figured out okay, the configuration that you need to set in the Helm chart is not being supported by the chart. This is not going to happen to you for, with CDKs because you can access all the components within the chart um, programmatically, which you can see here. So you can filter a component by name or anything else and then change it the way you like. That's very cool. Um, there's a similar construct for plain YAML manifests. So if you don't have a Helm chart, but just plain old YAML manifests, there is the so-called include construct, which works exactly the same. Okay, talking about CDKs plus. Um, so yeah, that's a library called on um, on top of CDKs. It comes with these high level objects and functions, which we already learned are called le level two constructs. And it aims to simplify day-to-day -day use cases. Um, and it also aligns with Kubernetes versions, which means um, it aims to support. So for example, there are CDKs for 1.17, 1.18, 1.20, and uh, all of them aims to support the functionality of this version, but they are also upwards compatible. So if you are using, for example, 1.17, you can still deploy them on 1.19 or whatever. Okay, little example as well again. We start with a chart again. Now we have a config map. Take care that this is not like the config map from CDKs, but it, that's the um, config map from CDKs plus. So it has more functionality. So in this case, we add a directory. So it adds uh, files from a local directory into the config map. Then uh, another CDKs plus construct volume This that loads this config map and creates a volume off of it. Another CDKs plus construct of a deployment um, again, you can define your replica and then you can um, define the image, the command, stuff like that. Um, now another cool like intercooperation between these three components, you can mount the volume that we pre-created um, within the container. And then you can expo expose it using a service. Um, again, all of this could be handwritten, let's let's call it like that, with level one constructs, but we are taking CDKs plus here to simplify the process a lot. Okay, another term I already said, Java, Java support. So you can now use um, the Java programming language um, to define your Kubernetes manifests. Yeah, we'll just skim over the code. So it's a it defines a service. You can see builder pattern. Java people will get excited when you when seeing this code. Um, but yeah, from from concept, it's it's everything. Uh, everything is the same. Okay, now in a few minutes, what's to come? So Go bindings similar to Java. Um, Go Go will be added support for. I had a little um, yeah interview call with Eli, one of the main developers, um, in preparation to this talk, and yeah, he told me about that. Unfortunately, there isn't too much information available right now, so I cannot really show anything, but that's pretty much like, for example, the um, init command that you can expect to work in, in a few more months. And next big thing, 1.0 will be coming this year. Um, the main goal for now, at least what I've heard, there won't be any major features coming till then. Right now, it's uh, mainly about stability, so that the, the interfaces, the APIs um, will, will get stable, and also the CDKs plus API versioning I already explained beforehand um, will be finished until then. And then there are some ideas coming up. So we'll just list them here. So it's about Helm chart generation. So you can take your CDKs code and generate Helm charts out of it. You can um, publish constructs as CRDs, meaning, for example, the web service I, I showed earlier. Um, think of an operator running in your um, Kubernetes cluster that can take a YAML manifest um, based on this construct, so a web service custom resource, and um, create the, the according deployment and service out of it. That would be really neat. And uh, from my perspective, the, the coolest feature would be to um, be able to bundle your Docker images within the CDKs code. So there's a similar concept in AWS CDK where you package your application code and your infrastructure code together. That's also one idea that may be coming to CDKs. Um, but that's pretty much up to you. Um, CDKs has a community-driven uh, roadmap. So if you want to see any of those features, go to their roadmap and uh, add your vote, and they will act accordingly. All right, so that's the end of my talk. 
Uh, thanks everyone for joining. If there are still any open questions, feel free to contact me at um, the points on, on the screen. Um, two more things to say. Thanks for the orga. From, from my perspective, the, the CDK day has really been great um, since this point. So everything with the organization. And second and last point, uh, enjoy the rest of the talks. Okay, everyone, have a nice day and take care. Looks like my internet is behaving long enough for me to introduce the next speaker. Thank you so much, Max, for that. That was really awesome. So up next, we have Halale Tsang on her serverless experience with CDK. Hey, my name is Halale Tsang, and I can imagine that you've all been hearing about the word CDK. It's been used a lot today, and I can just tell you that I'm also here to add to the counter. So the documentation on the AWS website says this about CDK. The Cloud Development Kit is a software development framework for defining cloud infrastructure as code. And it does so by provisioning it through cloud formation. In simple terms, a CDK app is written in the programming languages of your choice using the AWS CDK to define your AWS infrastructure. The app you create defines one or more stacks which will contain constructs, which are the ones that define one or more AWS resources that you will be using. So for example, it could be Lambda, it could be S3, it could be DynamoDB and so forth. So right off the bat, I can just tell you that the reason why I chose CDK is that you are able to use it with programming languages of your choice. And because I was learning Python, this was really good for me. So the languages would, would be Python, TypeScript, JavaScript, Java, C Sharp. So these are the languages that are normally used by developers and CDK was actually built for that. In this way, it is also of benefit to developers who can just use their AWS services expeditiously using CDK because of the routine usage of programming languages rather than using CloudFormation where they would just use YAML or JSON. So this meant that developers would have to learn new syntax in order to provision their AWS resources with the result being that it decreases productivity time. So another side note for you lovers of Go, you'll be pleased to know that using Go is in developer preview. So don't forget to use CDK and share your thoughts on that. So these are the logos of the services that I have used. It's Sam the Squirrel on the left because I went serverless. And I can tell you that the pros for serverless is that there is no server management and it scales per usage of our application. And remember that th this was a simple application that I was learning. Um, so as I was learning, there was no need to provision EC2 instances for a simple app because I used tutorials and little workshops. So serverless for me was the way to go. And doing this tutorial was a great lesson because like I said, I'm learning Python. So there is no better way of learning than doing. So I got to do that and also give me a bonus because I get to get my hands dirty and build more with Lambda and just get to see how it works. So for the first step of the tutorial of creating a serverless app using CDK, I just wanted to show you guys how easy it would be to start on your journey of using CDK for your environment. So you do not need to go haywire in order to set up your environment. And in my experience, I've had times where setting up the environment was the hardest part. So for this one, you can't just worry, you can just dive in and go right in. Because as a developer, you already know the programming language you will be using. Then most definitely you have your favorite IDE and for this one I used VS Code. So you would also have to install Node.js. And because it's an AWS tool, if you are an AWS user, you will have to use an AWS account. You will have to have that. Then you would create a user that has programmatic access. So in that way you can use the AWS CLI which allows you to talk to AWS resources from the terminal. And then you would store the CDK toolkit, which is what we're here for, which is a command line tool for working with your CDK apps and stacks. So that right there on the left is the color all developers want to see. You want to see green on your screen, then you know that you are doing the right thing. So because nobody wants to see red on the screen. And I can tell you that as a beginner, this was a big motivator for me. So nothing hectic was done here, I can tell you that, but this was still a motivator for me to keep on moving. So on the right is the things that I have noted. 
So in the beginning, you want to create your directories in order to hold your projects in. And then you choose the language of choice. It could be one of the five that I've mentioned before. So I have chosen Python. The second thing is to initialize the project. Then I had to activate the project's virtual environment. So the letter is very important. And I'm telling you guys so you don't forget and make the same mistake that I did. So I did the project late at night. I activated the project's virtual environment, then closed all my open programs and went to bed. The following day, when I began again to work on it, I forgot to activate the virtual environment. So there I was installing my apps dependencies and wanting to access modules that were installed in the VN and I most definitely got errors. So this is a reminder to always check the path in which you are working at. .vn is what you want to see at the beginning of your path because you want to activate the virtual environment. So this is just a reminder, I went through it so you don't have to, you always have to activate your virtual environment. So now we can move into the deeper stuff of the project, which is called the meat of the application. I can just tell you guys about the CDK stacks because these contain constructs, each of which would define your AWS resources and would be represented as types in the programming language of your choice, as I have explained. So a construct can have multiple levels, either being a component or just a single piece. A component could either be an API gateway that you would use with the Lambda function and maybe that would upload to your S3 bucket. So that would be the group of your component. Then the single piece would, would just be you using Lambda. So now where CloudFormation gets to work in is when you use the CDK toolkit using the following commands. So CDK Synth, you, it's the toolkit that provides the ability to convert one or more AWS CDK stacks to AWS CloudFormation templates. And related as so it's a process called synthesis cdk synth synthesis and to deploy your stacks to an aws account and we would do that by using the command cdk deploy to simply deploy the specified stacks to our account and for people who'd want to be extra meticulous you would use the cdk diff just to see differences between our cdk app and what will be deployed it simply allows you to see the modifications you have made and it does so by comparing the specified stack with the deployed stack or a local CloudFormation template. So now moving on to the CDK construct library. There are so many AWS CDK constructs written in the construct library. And this is an extensive library and is divided into several modules. One for each of the AWS services as you can see on the left. For example, if you'd be using S3, you would install the package from the construct library. And if it's for RDS, you would install that too from the construct library and so forth. And because I went the serverless route, I had to do the same. Then add a Lambda function to my stack and use the specific runtime, which is 3.7 for Python. After all that, I could just do all the necessary changes to my code. I would add the functions, synthesize and deploy. And that was it. That was literally it. I had just created my serverless app using CDK. You just use CDK from the terminal and the IDE and then you create the serverless app. And I definitely implore you to do the same. The workshop is not that hard and would not take much of your time. And I promise you'd want to see which other projects you can do using CDK because I feel like I want to know what else I can do. And then there are so many examples that you can get from the web, like on GitHub and the tutorials on the AWS website, which are also checked. And my first and favorite being the CDK workshop by Elad, who will be having his talk later on. So we are through with my talk and enough with the technicalities. I just want to say that I had a wholesome experience and I have learned a lot from these tutorials. One thing I also loved about the CDK workshop is that they want you to type the code and stuff instead of copying and pasting. And you know how developers are with control C, control V, so you don't want to do that on these tutorials. So because if you write the code, you learn more and you get to see the effect of code completion. And it also gets easier for things to be embedded to your memory when you type them out. And with all the experience, I will definitely try to do more with what I have learned. And side note, don't forget to use this command CDK destroy at the end of your tutorial because you do not want unexpected charges on your account. So I'd love to give thanks to Taiti and Veliswa who have helped me create this talk and definitely keep me on my toes with the task that I had to do in order to give you guys this talk. A definite thanks to the CDK team who have created this marvelous framework and keep on maintaining it so we get to enjoy and play around with CDK. 
my name is Khali and thanks for giving me 10 minutes of your time follow me on Twitter LinkedIn and do check out my work in progress blog where I get to digress some of my learnings thank you guys Did I mention this, that Khali and I are homegirls. I've been so excited about Khali's talk. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Khali. Thank you for that talk. So now I'm going to hand over to Thorsten. Yeah, and I'm happy to introduce um, our next um, talk about observability for CICD with Nushnika. I hope I got it right. Oh, you did it just right, Thorsten. Perfect. So, much. so the stage is yours. All right, everybody. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen so we can see the presentation. If I could just get a thumbs up or, oh, hey, it looks great. Fantastic. Okay. So uh, the, the, the circuit of this talk is, as you see, without observability, CI, CD doesn't work. Um, love to have an interpreter here. We should be a, a pretty straightforward talk. I sometimes get to talking a little bit rapidly, but... We'll do our best. We'll all we'll all try to muddle through. Let me just do start a timer though, because you know we don't want to realize that we've taken forty five minutes when we did not mean to. Okay, so a little bit about myself. My name is Noshnika. Nika is fine if you have trouble pronouncing Noshnika, but I will make fun of you. Um, I work at New Relic. I am a dev advocate specializing in serverless and cloud engineering. You can find me on Twitter at serverless mom and on Twitch at serverless mom, where I do try to mainly talk about serverless and other fun things like that. Okay. We've got a little bit of audio echo. So um, Arthur, if you could maybe just turn down your speaker just a little bit. Uh, and I hope I hope we're working great, but I think oh great we're in, we're in very good shape on my side. So hopefully we're in good shape. Okay, so how do we begin? A horror story called DevOps. <laughs> we all have these incidents, these responses that just don't go as well as we planned. So um, in my case, one day I was trying to go out for a hike in uh, the um, park here in Portland, which is the largest um, uh, uh, urban park, park inside an urban center in Portland. And um, what I got was a page saying, hey, nobody knows why, but we think maybe Redis is not working correctly. And this, of course, didn't start there. It started with, uh, we had a salesperson who was presenting material, of course, in a demo, of course, for one of our enterprise customers and the product was not working as we expected. So everybody had their own theory. And I know this is a dense slide, but I'm actually going to read it because it really is a pretty good uh, um, a, a synopsis of what we saw in our, in our Slack chat for the incident, right? We said, well, throughput is the same. The number of requests coming through is the same. But maybe our DB queries are getting beefier. They're taking longer. Uh, let's ask a DBA or database administrator to take a look. Uh, somebody else replied, hey, you know what? I don't think the problem is even on the back end. Uh, I think that maybe it's just a front end issue. It's sending requests that's not coming through. Since we don't see the error rate, uh, let's have the front end team come and take a look, right? And then, of course, you get to these two classic questions, which are, well, maybe the problem is just local to our network. Maybe the, the salesperson was signed into our VPN. Can somebody switch off the Wi-Fi on their phone, try it from a mobile network, and see if, see if it works? And then somebody else comes back and says, hey, maybe it's our geo. Let's go ahead and wake up the Dublin team and they'll take a look. And I think we all have been here, right? We've all been at this point where this is pretty painful, where now everybody's involved, everybody's in a text chat, and it's just really hard to nail down what's going on. And, and even if the problem resolves really easily, at this point we've had you know, 10, 20 people disrupted to be able to get to the bottom of an issue. So one thing that's really important to note here is that during an incident, it's really the timeline that is critical. So if we can establish that one component is earlier than the others, that really helps us understand that it is probably has a causal relationship with the other components. Um, 
And uh, one run request for our organizer, if there is a, there's an event chat and I, I do not have a link to it. So if they wanted to drop that into the uh, StreamYard chat, I would just super duper appreciate that. Um, but, uh, cause I can't see if you're, if you're sending questions in chat, but I promise I will try to get to them by the end of the presentation. Um, so during an incident, it's really that timeline that matters. Now, when we go to chop up an error like that, there are these components we'd really like to answer almost every time, right? When we have a mysterious problem, and usually I think of them in, in, in something like I'd like to know these four pieces. I'd like to know the error rates on each component, right? When we say, hey, we're seeing errors in the front end, okay, well, are we getting them within our, our, our application layer? Is the data layer seeing them? The throughput on the back end would be my next question. And when I say back end, I'm trying to go as far back as I can, right? So if I can say, hey, here's the throughput on the database layer, if I say, hey, the database layer suddenly lost all of its requests, that's a really strong indicator. Next, I'd like to say, hey, did we change our permissions and configuration? And finally, and this is the topic that really we're thinking about is, what's the deployment history? Did some piece of the code or infrastructure change today, right, recently? Now, um, it, we would expect that our use of infrastructure of code should have made this quite a bit easier, right? Because where previously this sort of these four pieces might be missing the fact that we had reconfigured something, had maybe reduced the um, uh, uh, the provided the provisioned uh, resources to one surface or changed routing. We would hope that if we're using infrastructure as code, we're able to see really readily that that piece has changed. But I would submit that even though when using infrastructure as code, it's possible to see that something did change at a particular time and probably correlated out to say, hey, this happened relatively earlier. Also, once everyone is awake, in general, you, you do get somebody saying, oh, we did change, you know, we, we did deploy this code change recently. But there are really two barriers to that as a complete understanding. The first is that hopefully we are moving towards an extremely, you know, continuous deployment world where it's really not that notable that we released some code. So on the human side, it may well not be that the uh, team lead or incident response person from a team knows for sure that no code has changed. And then secondarily, I would submit, this is a, this is a slide that shows up in every one of my presentations wherever I go, the speed with which we can read a dashboard has a direct effect on our observability. So you know, it may be that a code change is, is findable somewhere as, 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 a, as a repository commit, but that doesn't mean that we can uh, that we can do it quickly. And so we still have everybody woken up and everybody uh, pinged to try and figure out what's going on before we say, oh, right, this piece changed beforehand. This is um, this is a, a, a Prometheus, a Grafana dashboard on a Prometheus database. And I, I show it here. Obviously, we're not going to read any of this tiny, tiny writing. But I do say, you know, hey, you can look at this and you can start to have a theory right away about what is the cause of our problem. And I really, really like that uh, that piece. And in the end, this sort of results in a pretty difficult mindset, right? Uh, we just sort of, we get to this point where even after the thing is resolved, we're like, I just, I don't want to deploy on Fridays. I don't want to deploy, um, you know, uh, to these components. I want to limit people's ability to, to, to release things. It's just something we're like, boy, this is this is tough. It's tough to support. So I've talked a couple times about observability, and I'm going to take just a minute to say, hey, what is observability really? Um, because, you know, is it just a marketing buzzword? It's a very common term specifically on the West Coast of the United States, but it, it's not necessarily used everywhere else. Um, so I think of observability as being the speed with which we can understand a problem. So, you know, this is a pretty low res picture, but if you take a look at it from it, you can pretty quickly say, oops, there is a problem here. We are having a problem, right? And ideally we wanna go from knowing that we have a problem to understanding what we might do next pretty quickly. And, and, and that is all, all that observability is, is, is the time it takes us to do that. So we can have situations that have almost no observability, like um, 
if we know that we have a problem with sort of a classic, uh, you know, maybe self-hosted or virtual uh, server, and we say, oh, um, it, it gets in some weird state, it stops working in this specific way, and then you just restart it. And so in that case, you know, we're able to fix a problem, but we don't understand it at all. So we sort of have like no observability. Um, and so for most of us, the observability question, the question of how quickly we can understand a problem is a lot more about stress than it is about a particular engineering goal. So increased observability will not de facto mean that you deliver more nines or more uptime or that you deliver faster performance, but it does mean that every single failure will get resolved with a lot less stress if you have more observability. Now, once you resolve that stress, you hopefully get to a point where you can say, okay, um, uh, not only do I understand these incidents, but also I can see how we're gonna move forward from this and how we're going to uh, handle some problems before they become large enough to really affect us. I keep my goals for observability on a team kind of low. I say, my goal is that when a salesperson gets in touch and says, hey, this component isn't working, you know, I'm trying it out on my way into a demo, you can say, hey, we actually knew about this 10 minutes ago and it's almost resolved now. It's not that you're never gonna have a problem that somehow affects you know, your service, but the fact is that you wanna hopefully detect it a little sooner than just having it be something that an end user t is telling you about for the first time. Okay. So how do we get to this point? How do we get to this point of having real observability of our complete stack? It's not the most, it, it, it can seem when we first think about it like a pretty long road to get to a stack where we can sit down, say, hey, we have some sort of problem and be able to say in a few minutes, what we sort of suspect very strongly is the, the cause and also what our next steps are. If we can get to a point where we can feel like we know that within a few minutes, then we're starting to feel like we have real control over our stack. And, and if you're at a point where you're maybe going in and just kind of manually looking at recent permissions changes or going and snooping through everybody's commits to a repository, it can feel like, oh my gosh, this is just, we're, we're, we're really, really far away from that. In general, we would say that there are three components we wanna have for a well-measured system. And this can help us kind of break down what we need to do into smaller and smaller pieces. So the first, this is a quote from Kandinsky, everything starts from a dot. This is three pillars by Kandinsky. You know, I, come on, I gotta tie this together a little bit. And this is the concept that one of the pillars of uh, observability is just a dot. It is an X, Y coordinate that one of the pillars of observability is knowing metrics, right? Um, uh, metrics are the most dense and densely transmitted of, uh, of the observability pieces. A very tiny uh, packet of information can contain all that we need to know about performance, about low throughput. It's the kind of stuff we get generally out of the box, any place in AWS, right, that we're getting some kind of metrics that, that show us what's going on in a, in a component. And so when we ask things like, what are what is the throughput on each component? It's very easy to say, oh yeah, we, we have metrics that will give us that right away. So the next piece is logs. And, you know, the thing about logs is there's always a lot of logs, right? Logs can be anything. They're, they're very often human readable, um, text components that <clears throat> give us some kind of detail about something that's going on and may or may not have been sort of human designed or maybe maybe there is the result of some library that we're using or some other component. Logs always have the answer to what's going on. Log if observability was just, is the answer somewhere, then once you're doing enough logging, you'd say, oh, well, we, we for sure know the answer somewhere. And the problem with logging sort of de facto, like if you're just using it naively and just say, hey, I'm just gonna add a bunch of log statements all over my code, I'm gonna store those logs and that means I have observability, is that logs can often get us in a situation where we get back some information, but it is not the information that we were expecting. So in this case, uh, you know, this, this is a, a classic story that Diogenes of Sinope asks Plato to say, you know, you can't define anything, you cannot, 
uh, uh, absolutely prove anything to me. He says, Plato, just tell me what, what, what is a man? Tell me what a man is. And Plato thinks about it for a minute. He says, oh, it's easy. A man has no fur on, on, on his body, and he walks around on two legs, and that's a man. And I just did it in two sentences, so I can define anything very easily. And Diogenes says, look, I've brought you a man. <laughs> so with logging, this is the real, this is the very real problem that we have with logging. When we say, oh, I want to go in and get some information um, from logs, we'll get a lot of results that may not be exactly what we're looking for. The last piece of, of, of observability is tracing, and tracing is about detailed performance monitoring. And so it doesn't, it's, we're not going to talk about it here, frankly. Uh, it doesn't make a ton of sense for, for this issue. When we're talking about a failure or an error, tracing is usually not going to help us. Tracing is things like storing the time spans that every uh, act takes, and also how those requests are connected. And that piece, for that piece, you could say that tracing is useful. So something like AWS X-Ray is useful, but um, it is not. It's not part of this talk. I just want to say it's the third pillar. So we'll 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 move on from there. So um, let's talk about a brief history of the concept of tracking um, uh, deployments and other code changes in a way that is usable and quickly readable. So um, I worked for New Relic, and back in the day, uh, uh, when New Relic first had a concept of tracking um, deployments, let's let's talk about how we did it at, at the outset. So um, early on, this is a mock-up that I made because this interface is not a, is no longer active on New Relic, but it, it's it's still a pretty good representation of what it looked like when we first thought, hey, we want people to track deployments along with metrics. We tried implementing an API endpoint to say, hey, there was a deployment on this application or this entity. And it sort of was, it was like a specialized event database that said, um, give us a time that the deployment happened, give us what entity it happened to, and then a short string that explains what, it ha what happened. So if you, if you would hover over this indicator line, it would give you some sentence about, about what had happened. And so, you know, this at first was a pretty good, you know, initial implementation of that concept. So um, it would show up on graphs everywhere for that entity, and um, you could have forever and get a little data. Now, if, in, implicitly, this was a bit limited, right? Because you had to design a system that, when it when you were deploying code, was always sending out something to our API endpoint. And since this was back in like 2010 or 2012. Um, you know, there wasn't the ability necessarily to automatically connect, you know, every single deploy to a deployment indicator. And the other piece was being tied to a single entity, trying to trying to tie down, hey, this change happened to this application it was a totally reasonable concept when we were deep in the virtual machine world. But it wasn't necessarily as reasonable once you're having like whole swarms of microservices that may have interdependencies and so may very actively be affected by changes that have happened to other services. We did, however, find a really interesting uh, uh, corollary once we did any kind of deployment indicators at all, which is that while we thought of it as being an incident response tool to say, hey, we're suddenly down, we suddenly have no throughput on a particular service, um, uh, we instead saw that a very common use for it was when kind of metrics had just shifted a little bit. So, uh, you know, a, a classic example is something like this. I was worried our ads weren't working. Turns out the last deploy broke our analytics. So instead of a, a marketing team running around and saying, oh my gosh, our AdWords are suddenly ineffective or we need to spend more money over here, we said, oh, we just deployed something to the front end and suddenly our throughput here dropped. It must be that we deployed something that, that broke our metrics. And so, uh, um, and so this very effectively showed us that the value of seeing when deployments happened stretched a lot further than just responding to single alerts and more into a deep understanding of how our system was working. So with the CDK and, and, and in a larger cloud environment, logs are very often the way to go and build that kind of real insight. 
So rather than using like a specialized event database that is just for logging, uh, you know, just for, for storing deploy information, um, which is more of a specialized case, logging absolutely is the way to, to, to get the kind of deep information we actually want about what's changing on deploy. Now, we're uh, all, all, all almost out of time, um, and uh, I'm not going to presume to like uh, exactly instruct us in how we're going to make these connections for our team. Um, there absolutely are great tools out there, and I'm going to talk about a few of the sort of general ideas for moving to a space where deployments and other code changes are more observable by your whole team. So here's a few that I think are really, really key. So one is, and I apologize, the text is just a little bit small, but I'm going to read through all four of these, is one is to have CloudWatch admit, emitting signals when we have a log matching a pattern. So rather than going through and trying to find patterns ourselves, if you do the time do uh, do the legwork ahead of time to say, hey, CloudWatch, when you see a log event like the, uh, a log line like this, uh, uh, go ahead and emit a signal. This is a really effective way to get your team a little more synchronized about what we're expecting to see and what we'd like to see every time we, we do have a change. Now, um, the next one is to use the AWS logs module with the CDK. So uh, some kind of standardization and training across your team is a very effective way to make sure that new resources are logging correctly and showing new events. And then obviously we want to try to connect every CI CD path to logging. So this is something that we want to uh, discuss with our team. And again, something that you'll see is kind of a common theme here is that a lot of these are actually just cultural changes within your team rather than being changes that have to happen uh, 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 to be able to, um, that, that, that happen on a technical level to sort of force those changes throughout. It's less about adopting a certain library than adopting a practice within your team. And then the last one, and this is a very standard piece of AWS advice, but it doesn't mean it's not great, is to use some form of structured logging. So the more that you can log objects that reflect state a little more clearly, the more likely you are to be able to look in later and be able to parse and use that log correctly. And CDK even has options for logging things like tables and stuff that can be really effective. So that's been my time, folks. I know I do, I do I'm sure, have a link in my email to the event chat. And so that's where I'll be hopping over to uh, in just a moment. Um, but uh, again, I'm, I'm Noshnika. Nika is fine if you can't pronounce Noshnika. And um, I am on Twitter at Serverless Mom and on Twitch at Serverless Mom, where uh, right now what we're doing is building a computer from scratch on a breadboard. Uh, which has been a fun project for the last couple of weeks. Um, I think we have our next uh, speaker ready to go. Hey, Eric. Hey, how are you? No sneaker. Uh, <laughs> you got it. You got, I got it. it. Hey, just FYI, we did add the link uh, for the chat, so you probably have some questions going on there. We added it uh, quite quite a bit earlier. So uh, yeah, if you and, and just so y'all know, if you need that link, and I'll say it verbally, it's at cdkday.com forward slash watch, oh. and it's got all the links to the CDK Dev, the Wonder Me, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I also see that there's like a there was also like a tab on this thing uh, that that I missed, and I've I've got the comments now, so now I feel super rude. There'll be a lashing later, and and we'll we'll have it out. But no, you're good. Everything's good, and and a great talk on observability. Uh, I'm a huge fan of observability. I'm not, you know, and and I'm passionate about it, and I love that you talked about it. So thank you. Uh, uh, so I do. If, if it's okay. We got a couple of minutes, so you mind if I answer yeah. the questions that are in the comments? Please First do. Of all, Please do. Yes, yes. This does say Jatsu or dumplings uh, because I love dumplings. So I'm glad to have. Uh, uh, neon that, that, that says so. When I saw this, when I saw this piece of neon for sale, and there was some of the Mandarin that I could actually read, I I, I love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and thank you, thank you so much for the replies. I really, really appreciate it. I know some people have seen me uh, uh, streaming on Twitch and uh, seen some of the captured streams on YouTube, which I which I love. Um, and then, what was the name of the drawing at the beginning? What was the name of the drawing at the beginning? What was the name? Three well, three pillars by Kandinsky. That's what's the that's the actual piece of art that I had. Uh, uh, and then this is a this is a book plate from the actually from the 
uh, Shakespeare project that there was this illustrated Shakespeare that was released in about 1850. And there's a project with some university to release it. If you go, if you go and Google like Shakespeare plate um, public domain, you'll, you'll find them all. And so uh, I love it because it's illustrations of Shakespearean scenes in kind of like 1840s, like uh, 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 components. Um, the one about Plato. Oh yeah, that's just that's just I don't know. That's just Diogenes of Sinope. I absolutely love uh, talking about Diogenes quotes. But uh, yeah, <laughs> no, no, the Plato one. I don't. I didn't have a picture of Plato. But oh, this here is Three Pillars by Kandinsky. Uh, There's a question from Kyle Roach on here, uh, oh. Nikon. Any advice on how to use uh, along with CloudWatch log metrics? Yeah. So. Um, you absolutely need to have some solution that integrates uh, CloudWatch metrics and CloudWatch logs. So there are a ton of ways to do that. New Relic is one of many that will import CloudWatch logs as necessary and will also, of course, access CloudWatch metrics. There's a CloudWatch API um, to grab those components out uh, really effectively. So, um, you know, I would generally say you for most you know modern cloud architectures you want to be using as your logging path you want to be la logging out to cloudwatch and then processing those logs separately so it's great to use some kind of subscription filter to make sure you're not sending absolutely everything as these huge data outs but um you do want to you do want to use cloudwatch as your endpoint because especially like i mean you know serverless is my whole bailiwick so that's what i want to talk about any uh, any other way that is that you would sort of just code up on your own, you're going to end up adding to your Lambda's runtime and other components, and that's just you're not going to be that happy with that. But if you try to send even a very beefy object out to your CloudWatch logs, that goes just like that. So if you're like, oh, I don't want to use CloudWatch, then you want to look into the extensions API, which is definitely an advanced you know Lambda engineers tool, which. You know, our team uses it, but boy, oh boy, that one is <laughs> that one feels a little tough to do. Um, what's really nice is to use tools like um, like uh, New Relic, and there's a really great version of it from Honeycomb, and I know Lightstep has really good versions of it to actually process your logs out into uh, the metrics that you might be getting out, and so telling you things like the rate that something is occurring within your logs. And that's a really great way to get like high cardinality data out without just resorting to sort of chewing everything down and processing it into more readable metrics. Uh, really, really good question. We had, a, we had a follow up to that. Is there still benefit in using Graf Grafana for applications on AWS? Yeah, fantastic. So um, the thing to really keep in mind is that by default, CloudWatch is, don't get mad at me, Eric. By, um, by, by, no, I know you will. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you said serverless is your bailiwick. We're good. <laughs> um, by default, right? For example, with serverless, how much is going to give you metrics related to building and high level performance? So using a tool like um, Grafana is going to make a ton of sense if you are sending some metrics that go a little bit deeper than that into a kind of application insight that obviously you're not gonna get by default from CloudWatch, right? So something like, hey, what was the slowest method within my code is just not something that it's, it, it, by design, it's not something that AWS is trying to give you insight with out of the box. So if you use something like an open telemetry uh, package or you use a new relic agent or you use one of the several other products that help you do like that level of function insight, it's really great to be using Grafana libraries to, to chart that stuff. So what's nice now is that there's a totally open source ways to do this. And so I really, really love people who are using open telemetry packages to store, to send like trace data and other performance data, talking about one of those pillars, right, which is tracing. Um, and to be able to send that data up to something like a, uh, a Prometheus DB and then, and then chart it with Grafana is fantastic. You know, I'm going to surprise you here, uh, but I would tell you that, yeah, uh, CloudWatch, those kind of tools, they give you the ability to build a lot of the stuff. They're incredibly powerful. Yeah. But out of the box, you're right. Out of the box, it's you're not going to, some of the stuff you're not going to immediately get. And that's why we, so we love our partners. That's why we, yeah. we love a new relic and something like that, where they're building these common uh, desktop or, or dashboards that, that grab that for you out of the box. So yeah. yeah. And if someone told me, hey, when you go to use this platform, it installs something like the new relic agent, I would be like, no, nah, I don't want that. Like what happened to the, you know, shared responsibility model that says, hey, I don't want you necessarily keeping track of every function call that I make, right? What if one of my function calls is called, you know, 
this slash username slash location, right? I don't want you just throwing that up on a dashboard by default, right? We want to use something like a partner product in an intentional way to say, hey, this is one of the ones we want this deep insight into. Um, because it introduces other problems and, and again, it, it, it sort of muddies the shared responsibility model. Okay, that I think is my time though. So I think we got to let our, our next speaker up. I know Eric, you're the one in charge with that. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody lets me be in charge, but I do have <laughs> buttons I can push. So, all right, yeah. Thorsten, I'm going to turn it over to you. And yeah. uh, here you go. Yeah, and I will introduce uh, some fantastic people from Liberty Mutual talking about how they scale CDK in their company. All righty. Give me one second. I'm going to share that out. We're also switching out our, our interpreter. So, Norma, you are up. I want to just take a moment and give a shout out to our interpreters, Norma, Arthur, uh, Nicole, and Kim. Uh, you guys have been fantastic. Uh, and I appreciate it. And thank you. And, Norma, you're on screen. Are you ready? All righty. Here we go. I'm going to take uh, Arthur off and then we'll start the video. Nika, thanks again. I appreciate it. Oop. <laughs> I removed for response. Yeah, but I think we have. Yep, so we've got uh, one more session here, uh, and it's a, it's a Liberty Mutual session, right? Exactly. That's what I just announced. But I think we have a video issue with the interpreters. Oh, okay. Uh, Arthur, are you staying on for the moment? So we'll have Arthur stay on until Norma can can uh, take over. We'll get this started. I'm here, but I got to get running. I got to be okay. somewhere else. But we'll All continue. right. We'll get this started and work this out while it's going. The opinions expressed in this presentation represent the presenter's view about CDK, serverless, and AWS products for informational purposes. The content in any way should not be treated as an official endorsement of AWS technologies by Liberty Mutual and does not reflect the views of Liberty Mutual. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll be talking about how we scale CDK using the software accelerator. First, uh, my name is uh, Rajesh Kanan Porayan. Uh, I am the founder of few things. Um, the first one is called uh, the Digital Native Architecture, uh, and the second one is called the Software Accelerator. Uh, we will be talking about both of them uh, in our cloud, so let's first journey. Um, and with me, I have Mark McCann, uh, Greg Baumkamp, and Nick Manuel. Uh, I'll have Mark introduce himself. Mark. Thanks, Rajesh. I'm Mark McCann, Senior Architect at Liberty, and I've worked with Rajesh for many years, building enabling capabilities to help our teams succeed. All right, let's start our cloud you know, journey. Uh, we started our journey sometime in 2016, and here is how our architecture looked like. Uh, pretty familiar to most of you, right? Uh, we had uh, web applications with supporting APIs, um, interacting with um, both stateful and stateless you know, business services. Some of them were long running business processes, talking to our domain services and data services, and finally to our humongous database. Right? As usual, we had multiple tiers and layers within them, and they were too tightly coupled and as you can see, a simple database change will ripple through you know, all the layers and tiers and eventually um, we have to have a long scheduled coordinated release and a significant governance process, right? So things became very slow. It was really challenging to roll out any new features, right? And when things go, went wrong, you had to basically roll back one by one, right? And it was tedious. Uh, we definitely needed to change. So we kind of uh, started uh, with a question, you know, what what if we start up as a brand new organization, right? Like a startup, and know that we are going to be like a multi-billion dollar Fortune 100 company, right? What would our future architecture be, right? Um, so with that question in mind, um, you know, we also thought about, okay, if we are starting up as brand new, 
who is the you know the future consumer you know what's their behavior that we are targeting and um, uh, we defined our future consumer as someone uh, who is called digital native right um, you know they are always connected and um, they are very good at abandoning traditional channels and pretty much they are the disruptors right uh, for example you know they abandoned um, blockbuster and they went with netflix they abandoned travel agents and they went with priceline so the list continued um, with uber and airbnb and so on right so what if they abandon our traditional channels um, so what do we do so we wanted to basically make sure we are wherever they are and and we felt like it's important to expose all of our business capabilities as consumable APIs so that we can expose them we can be wherever they are whether it's mint.com or zillow.com or you know any other dot com right so with that in mind um, we came up with an execution strategy of course you know we want to be like a startup and we want to be in the cloud cloud native and we want to make sure we follow api first strategy and and eventually build everything as a service so that someday we can monetize right so when you look at cloud native of course you know we have 12 factor apps microservices uh, elastically scalable fault tolerant and when you look at api first you really want to be like standards based you know consumable discoverable you know open api and so on and from a culture perspective you want self you know empowered self service teams so they can deliver features at will right so with that um, we came up with a architecture you know model with domain driven design at the core so we can break down our monolithic into manageable functional bounded context um, with each bounded context owning their own microservices and apis and we wanted to make sure they are event driven right from the beginning so we can you know react to things we can you know do real time stream analytics and so on so the quest to build that wonderful microservice architecture started um, and um, uh, you start with 12 factor app and then you realize that you want to have everything as code you know configuration is code infrastructure is code pipeline as code and and you want zero downtime deployment right and um, so and then your microservices you know they come and go and you want to be able to kind of um, discover them at runtime so they need to be able to register somewhere so you can discover them right so you want service registry and discovery and when things go wrong you want to be able to you know trace them you know distributed tracing and and you want observability and you know when things go wrong you want fault tolerance using circuit breaker right you name it right so here is that list you know by the time you google and click link after link you know read uh, one by one and spend many nights and weekends you are you know you realize that you know building distributed microservices is is really complex right and it's um, very uh, time consuming um, you know learning experience so we wanted to make sure um, our community you know doesn't feel that way we wanted to make it easier in such a way that um, everything is packaged for them right so we created blueprints um in such a way that you answer few questions and you get a you know brand new bounded context we call it as honeycomb um with everything needed for you a gateway a registry and uh, um uh, distributed tracing and configuration and all you need to do is just build your microservice and deploy to it right so everything was happening in minutes and here is the catalog that we stood up you know, back then in 2017 um, and things were going fine right um, you know definitely changed the way we deliver our software 
and uh, but are we better off right um maintainability um we were still doing a lot of heavy lifting um on cluster management container orchestration uh, many of the open source projects that we used became inactive and um, community involvement we were too opinionated right um we gave a good start but the community was not jumping uh to extend beyond what we were offering right they did not really add any new you know blueprints and innovation uh, the ability to innovate uh, was still slow right so it was you know we were good but you know there were some lessons right so what we did we took a step back again right as usual um, uh, technology landscape changed and um we wanted to evolve with it right um and the question here is how do we go from good to great um right so we did three things uh the first thing um i wrote um a couple of six pages um following the aws model and um um then uh, i socialized it with uh, everyone at all levels right um and couple of messages um we need to be like a serverless for software factory you know that was the key message um and then the third thing you know um i pull over mark we define our north star and and mark says hey rajesh you know we need to do serverless and we need to do cdk and i you know i used to deep dive into those things and it's you know fully convinced with you know where we want to go and and we assembled our team very quickly and then we wanted to make sure it's community driven from number day one right and so we launched our um, software accelerator program with a mission uh, to empower our teams with self service tools patterns and best practices to deliver world class solutions towards our for serverless first um, vision so if you have an idea you should be able to create a working software and if you are proud of it you should be able to create a pattern out of it publish it so that the next team you know can just get it instantly and then iterate on it create a new you know enhancement or a new pattern out of it so it's like the flywheel effect right and um our goal was to make sure experimentation you know is is key uh, enable the experimentation so that they can innovate you know and and then eventually you know the pace of uh, uh, innovation will accelerate and that will re- lead to transformation right so that was the belief and um and this all happened during 2019 uh we launched our accelerator um by november 2019 and um i'll have mark continue on our north star our serverless first you know um vision and then we will hand it over to our team to demo the product thank you for your time thanks rajesh we crafted our north star as a serverless first company focused on delivering rapid business value But in Liberty we are standing on the shoulders of giants building on the amazing work of many teams across Liberty from 2014 through to today. Our journey has put in place the enabling building blocks and guardrails for success and establishing that rapid secure pathway to production aligned with our enterprise standards and controls. So when we crafted our serverless first North Star we knew we had the right environment in place to make our North Star a reality. And as we started to get adoption see the successes and challenges of our teams We had a great feedback loop in place to constantly improve and evolve our ecosystem. And this feedback from our teams really helped shape the evolution of the North Star to be now a well-architected serverless first company. With our serverless first North Star established, we needed a way to articulate what that meant and how it affects decision making in the enterprise. So in 2019, we came up with the compute order of preference. It helped teams ask the questions about using Lambda first, then falling back to other managed AWS services, then falling back to containers onto the pass, and eventually onto an on-premises solution. With the continued evolution of change, 
of, e of AWS Managed Services, this order would be different today as more and more use cases are handled by managed services, API Gateway, Step Functions, AppSync, S3, DynamoDB, EventBridge, and the list goes on. So we would use those managed services first and fall back to Lambda to glue those uh, services and capabilities together and then fall back to containers and the other options as I listed above if, if necessary. So how does CDK factor into this? Well, as Rajesh mentioned, we noticed CDK early and armed with the lessons from our previous experiences, we saw the massive potential CDK had to enable and empower our teams while lowering their cognitive burden of getting productive in the cloud. And as Matt Coulter has documented in his CDK Patterns journey, creating serverless CDK Patterns as an open source capability, it really showed us the, what was possible uh, within the enterprise. And one of our goals for the software accelerator was to shrink the gap between what is possible in AWS and what we could do within our enterprise. So we worked really hard to uh, remove impediments to adoption internally, and we worked very closely with AWS to ensure that any new features and capabilities that were released were aligned with their enterprise standards so that we could embrace them and get them into the hands of our developers really rapidly. Codifying these well-architected serverless-first engineering excellence patterns that are easily discovered, extended, and enhanced really has been a game changer for our teams. And supporting the community to create and contribute their own patterns to the accelerator helps keep that flywheel of evolution turning. And all of this has helped ensure our teams focus on delivering business value rapidly and not on undifferentiated work. Thanks, Mark. So Software Accelerator is a community-driven platform to facilitate the sharing and reuse of different software patterns throughout Liberty Mutual. It's built from the ground up to enable an entirely self-service model for pattern providers to create and share new patterns with Liberty Mutual's engineering community. While Software Accelerator's primary purpose is to jumpstart engineers to allow them to focus on delivering business value from day one, it also helps Liberty Mutual with building and scaling consistency, promoting best practices, and accelerating innovation throughout the company using a variety of different tools and frameworks, including AWS CDK. Software Accelerator strives to have all internal capabilities generated automatically. This includes things like source code repositories, the actual application code itself, and CI-CD pipelines with deployment environments. On top of all that, it'll even automatically deploy the generated code for you. All of these options that I've mentioned can be customized by the user's inputs uh, in the application. Now that we know a little bit more about what Software Accelerator does, I'll hand it over to Nick to show Software Accelerator in action from an engineer's perspective. Awesome, thanks, Greg. So like Greg mentioned, I'm gonna walk through how we envisioned engineers interacting with Software Accelerator. So I'll call out some of the key features and I'll also demo generating a CDK app using one of our pattern offerings. So we'll start here on our homepage. There are a few different paths we can take from here. So we've got a link here that will take us to documentation on how to contribute a pattern to our platform. But for today, we're gonna to focus on generating a project. So I'm just gonna click on create here and that's gonna take us to our pattern catalog. So each item here in the list is what we call a generator. So a generator is just a microservice that has logic defined in it to spin up a project based on a corresponding software pattern. And like we mentioned earlier, a big part of our platform is community contributions and sharing knowledge. So you can see here, we also list the owner of each generator. And for us, this is just a good call out of not only who's contributing to our platform, but you know, also who maintains and supports each of these generators. So as we scroll through here, you can see we have quite a few offerings. Most of these today are deploying infrastructure to AWS using CDK, but there are a few in here that are more of the, you know, Java API based patterns as well. So we also have a generator here called build your own generator and that does pretty much what it says. So it creates a generator and a pattern offering and it contributes, it helps you contribute it back to our platform. So this was just our way of making sure that the community contribution process was as easy as it can be and that it wasn't a limiting factor for our community. So let's go ahead and find a CDK pattern that we can generate from. So I'm going to jump over to our featured page. So this is a page that we added recently so that we'd have a place to showcase new patterns that have been added. 
So right now we're featuring CDK patterns because we're in the process of onboarding the patterns from cdkpatterns.com. So we've got about 15 of them over here so far, and we did have to tweak them slightly just to fit in with kind of our platform and some Liberty standards, but for the most part, we've left them unchanged. So these have been an awesome uh, addition to our pattern offerings, and they've been really easy to onboard for us. So let's take a look at the accelerator in action. So I'll choose simple web service here. So when I click on this, it's going to open what we call the technology preview. So this is just a dialog that provides more information about what this pattern creates. So we get a quick description here. We also get a diagram. So I can see that this pattern is going to create an API gateway that fronts a Lambda function that interacts with DynamoDB. We then have a section for badges. So this particular pattern is AWS well architected. So we're calling that out here. We then have a section on technology. So we're calling out the technologies that are used in this pattern here again, as well as providing links to more documentation on each of those technologies. And then finally, we have a section where we can provide additional links for documentation on this pattern. So I'm going to go ahead and click continue, and that's going to take us to the generator page for this pattern. Cool. So here we are on the generator page. So each generator is going to ask a series of questions that helps us to customize the patterns code and the CI CD pipeline. So I'll walk through filling out these prompts. We'll start here with the project name. Then I have the option to create a CI CD pipeline. So if I say no here, we're just going to end up generating a zip file with the pattern code in it. And as you can see, when I switch this to no, most of the prompts go away. So a lot of the answers that I'm giving here, we're just using to configure the CI CD pipeline. So I'm going to switch that back to yes. The next two prompts here are specific to our CI CD pipelines at Liberty. So I'll fill those in. Then I'll pick the AWS account and region that I want to deploy to. And then finally, I'm going to specify an environment classification. So, and the last prompt here is just asking for my email address. So I'll put that in and I'll click finish. So the accelerator generator is now going to customize the pattern based on my input, as well as create my code repository and build and deploy pipeline. And once all that's created, my build and deploy are going to kick off automatically. So that should take just a couple minutes to finish. So while that's running, let's take a look at some of the minor changes that we had to make to this pattern. So I'm going to start here in the stack configuration. So here we have an example of an accelerator token. So this is just our syntax for specifying variables that we want to replace throughout the pattern. Um, so this one here corresponds to that first prompt that I filled in for my project name. So the value that I put in there is going to be replaced with uh, the input that I put in during my generation. The other thing that I want to call out for a change here is the stack. So we've created a Liberty specific stack here, but we've also left the original one behind for our developers to reference. So if we open the Liberty specific stack and look at what we did to it, the major change here is that we're extending a base stack from a library that we created called SWA CDK core. And Greg's going to go into more depth on what exactly this library does. But in this case, we're extending this base stack because it's applying some Liberty Mutual tagging standards to the stack. So it's, it's really a convenience thing for us that we, we don't have to go in here and, and add those after the fact. So our project should be finished generating now. Let's go check on it. Cool, so our project is generated. Now we've got some links to our code as well as our build and deploy pipeline. I'm gonna go ahead and jump right to the deploy logs using that link. And we're gonna go ahead and grab the API gateway URL that was output in the logs there and invoke it a few times. So 
This will populate some data in our Dynamo table. So I'll copy this out and let's paste it into a new tab. I'm going to hit this with a path of test. So it looks like that worked. And then I'll try Nick as well. Awesome. Okay, so now I'm going to open up the AWS console and take a look at my Dynamo table. So we can see in our table here now I've got an entry for test and Nick with one occurrence in each of them. So let's hit this again and watch that number increase. Okay, awesome. It looks like that's working. So this has really demonstrated the power of the accelerator and what we were looking to accomplish when we originally created it. So as you can see, in just a few minutes, we were able to create a functional project and deploy it to AWS and test it out and see that it was working. Um, so, and on top of that, you know, these CDK patterns are going to be a huge win for our developer community. You know, they've been super easy for us to onboard and they're allowing us to increase our number of pattern offerings really quickly. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and hand things back to Greg and Greg is going to talk more about our CDK core library and how we're using it with these patterns. Yeah, thanks a lot, Nick. So one of the things that Nick and I had done previously was maintain a standard set of CloudFormation templates to help our organization deploy different AWS resources into the cloud. We spent a lot of time maintaining that library um, and there were still a lot of issues with things like tracking changes and helping users pick up those changes and pull them back into their own repos. So as soon as we began testing out CDK as a replacement for CloudFormation, we immediately saw the benefits of CDK over CloudFormation. Um, we also saw the power of creating these reusable constructs in code rather than YAML to help keep our maintenance times low. So with that in mind, we started the library SWA CDK core to start holding some of those components that we found we were using across pretty much all of our stacks. Um, these components include things like reusable constructs, different custom resources that we use across the company, and other default props to help adhere to Liberty compliance rules so that our resources don't go through remediation. This library really helps with remotely pushing out changes so that users can pull them in and also maintaining these compliance rules in a centralized spot. Our team heavily values the AWS CDK documentation. So with that in mind, we try to do as little abstraction in the library as possible so that our engineers can still receive the benefits of the library, but also reference AWS documentation when they run into issues. And similar to everything else, we built SWA CDK core with the intention that the community would do lots of contributing to it so that we can try to incorporate many use cases from across the company and not just the use cases that are directly in front of us. And we published the library to Pippi for Python and NPM for TypeScript and JavaScript users. So um, in order to accomplish that, we're using the awesome package from the AWS team, JSII. And this was really, really simple with Matt Coulter's help to get it set up it was really, really simple for us to get added. And it's an awesome, awesome tool. So now uh, engineers within Liberty are able to take advantage of Python and TypeScript or JavaScript. Now I'm going to highlight a few of the core components that we provide in SWA CDK core. One of the big core components in SWA CDK core is the base stack. So if we open up the stack folder, we can see the LM base stack here. And Nick had showed this in his demo previously. Um, inside here, we have a base stack, which extends the core CDK construct of stack. And we add in a few props that extend the original CDK construct props. And this is really coming back to us saying that we wanted to adhere to what AWS provides. So anything that you can pass into a stack originally, you can also pass into an LM base stack but we do provide a couple of inputs that are specific to Liberty that are the tags that we apply to the stack. These next two uh, pieces that I'm gonna highlight are contributions from one of the engineers within Liberty, Grady Barrett. Um, so he contributed one, an aspect that applies different, poli uh, different managed policies to uh, roles that are created in your stack. So what you do with this is it's an aspect. So when you apply this aspect to your stack, 
any instances of a role that are created will automatically add managed policies. And this is another one of those pieces that helps with Liberty's internal compliance. Next, this was also a contribution from Grady. So Grady's contribution allows us to manage our version of SWA CDK core separately from the AWS CDK versions. So previously what we'd been doing is we would update our dependencies every time AWS CDK release a new version, which as we all have seen, uh, they work on the package a lot. So they, they, they frequently put out new versions. Um, and that became a big chore for us because when you're releasing, you know, three or four versions a day, we have to continue to push out those new versions. So Grady's contribution basically moved all of those dependencies over to peer dependencies. And it allows us to manage a version of SWA CDK core separately as the users will manage the versions of AWS CDK in their own package JSON. So this was a huge, huge time saver for our team and was definitely the biggest contribution that we've had so far to the library. And that about concludes everything that we wanted to show today for SWA CDK core. Um, I'll just reiterate that CDK has been an absolute game changer for us in the way that we deploy AWS resources. Going from managing CloudFormation templates and passing those around to other users within the company, um, it, it was a real big chore. So being able to now switch to these libraries where we can use JSII to compile to different languages and basically push updates out through new versions, it's, it's been absolutely incredible. So thank you all very much for taking the time to see uh, Nick and my demo, and I will hand it back over to Rajesh. Thank you, Greg, and uh, uh, thank you everyone for listening to us for the past 30 minutes. Uh, we hope uh, this presentation uh, gave a good perspective on how you can accelerate your community as well, right? Um, have a great day and feel free to reach us at any time. Um, thank you. Bye. All right, what a great presentation. I said in the beginning of this, I'm not a CDK expert, but I have learned a ton. And it was really interesting to see a lot of, a lot of the uh, developer tools and the developer uh, you know, helps that, that Liberty Mutual has done there. Uh, this marks the end of track one for CDK Day. I hope you've liked it. I want to give a shout out to Norma, who's who's repeating what I'm saying right now. Uh, Alan and, and Arthur and Nicole and Kim, Thank you so much for for uh, doing the the, uh, the signing for us, translations for us. I want to give a thanks to our speakers uh, as well as the the team that put this together uh, with Matt Coulter and his team. I won't go through naming them all. I encourage you right now. CDK Track Two is not over, and Elad is going to be talking about what's coming up for CDK uh, and in you know what, what's next. So I encourage you to jump over there. It's s12d.com forward slash CDK day two is for track two. So it's going. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us and jump over to track two. We'll see you later.